Still waiting on Jake. I don't know. I don't know where Jake's at. That's because he touched base at this. No, but I would just start. We've had a quorum, so. Alrighty. Thank you, everyone, for being here for our Linden City budget kickoff for fiscal 2022-23. So this is our first, uh, as you know, we get together and have a kickoff meeting with all our department heads, uh, kind of scoping out um, plans and capital needs for the next year. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and start with uh, item number one here, and I'll, the budget adoption process, I'm gonna turn that over to Kristen here, who's gonna start us off. So I took calendars out there underneath the agenda. Just really quick for clarification, um, we were going to square in Daryl oh, okay. here, and Kathy. then yeah, and we've got a resolution. But Kathy, our city recorder, is picking up some food for us, so we'll get to that as soon as we can. Okay. We didn't forget about you. That's I'm not too worried about. It. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, there's a printout with the budget calendar. Um, and the uh, department heads have already received and submitted their budget requests, and tonight's the budget kickoff meeting. Um, the next thing will be on March 21st um, will be the um, adoption of the tentative budget. This is earlier than normal, um, where we're missing the first meeting in April, and then the first meeting in May, I will be out of town, so we're kind of starting earlier so we can get to the, the meetings that we need to. And um, so highlighted in yellow is um, April 18th. That will be the work session where we'll um, work with a, a draft of the proposed budget and, um, and, and that's the, the one where I want the most questions, the most, you know, let's hash things out. Do you really want to proceed on something? The most, get the most direction. So that as I'm refining the budget later on, there's no, there's, there's no surprises. That is what I would like. Um, and then um, the proposed budget will come back on May 16th, and then the final budget adopted June 20th. Those are all public budget discussions. Right. So state department. Discussions. Right. So state department, right? Yep. We actually do more than the state requirements as far as public hearings. We've we've done you're required to have one on your tentative budget and then when you adopt your final. But we've always thrown in another public hearing when we adopt the proposed, so it's kind of an intermediary step. The tentative budget is really pretty loose. It's this is the big picture, and we're whittling things down from there. Um, sound right? Yep. Okay. Okay, so uh, any questions about the calendar? Um, I know, Kristen, sometimes you like to make sure council members don't throw any curveballs last minute. What's kind of your drop dead date? So that, um, that one that's highlighted in yellow is the one where I'd like to just really hammer things out, and if there's, if there's, Questions, concerns, issues, let's 
have them resolved by that night. And of course, you don't have to wait to do it in public meeting. If you ever have any questions, you can contact me or any of the department heads. Okay, great. All right, so, um, so we've covered the review timeline for the budget process and adoption. And so, like, like Adam mentioned, we're going a little bit out of order. As soon as Kathy arrives, we're gonna circle back um, to the, the, the meeting um, resolution and do our call to order and roll call and all that with that and do our swearing in of we're excited to have our new council member Maggleby. Um, so we'll just move forward here on the work session agenda then um, item number two our financial outlook and this is going to be Adam and Kristen both um, giving us some information here. She is. You know what? Maybe we uh, maybe we hold off. That's a big segment. Yep. That's a big segment to. And we'll we'll jump into that here in a second. So let's let's do a quick little pause. Five minute recess, and then yeah. we'll come back to it. Does that work, man? Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Hey, so we'll pause for a minute. Get settled in. All right. So this is the time to get our food, and uh, then we'll jump back in. Given up on you know, coming back for that. Get whichever item is in your box. It's better than the Yeah, it's a, so mine's been elsewhere, and I uh, don't remember what I ordered, but it's something else that's fine. You got fish and chips in the room? Okay. Very good. Thank you. 
one of these little piglet sticks. And I bury it with this one. And it's the same as the other one. It's the other girl. online yep okay all right okay we'll go ahead and uh, reconvene back into our our session here so we'll first begin with our call, call to order and uh, the roll call why don't we start to my left and we can just kind of work our way around the table uh, Adam Cowley City Kristen Colson, Finance Director. Randy Powell, City Council. Mike Van Cherry, City Council. Van Broderick, President. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we always do it. <laughs> Mike Brower, Chief of Police. Uh, Mike Florence, Community Development Director. Chase Adams, uh, Finance Department. Juan Garrido, Public Works Director. Keith Bateman, Parks and Recreation. Carol Magleby, City Council. Brian Haas, City Attorney. All right, and Carolyn Lundberg, City Mayor. Okay, thanks everyone for being here. And then, and also our uh, Jake, we're hoping Jake Hoyt, City Councilman, will be here. And then also Phil Brown Phil was Brown's unable to be here. Phil Brown's actually at a conference yet this week, so if we're excusing him. Just All right. Okay, so uh, we're really excited tonight. We have a special um, opportunity here to uh, appoint our new council member, Daryl Magleby and do his swearing in and oath of office, um, which will be conducted by our city recorder, Kathy Mosman. So we, go up we will go ahead and-, make and it official? Do, Shall we turn on the lights back there so it's not so dark for yep, photo or?
better. Okay, and then uh, so we just have another item here. Item three on the um, agenda tonight is a review and action. So we're going to consider resolution 2022-3-R. And this is adopting the updated voter participation areas map. You might remember that was prepared uh, by the Utah County Elections Office and um, we had that. So Adam's gonna go ahead and put that up on the screen. So this is required if there's a citizen referendum, there's so many votes that have to happen within certain areas or districts. And the county divided those up based on uh, registered voters. And so they were a little bit late. Uh, we were required by as entities to adopt this at the end of December. The county hadn't finished the maps yet. And so we adopted our prior map. And so now we're readopting essentially the corrected map and then we'll send this to the state, so. All right. Hopefully we never have to use this, is what I'm hoping. Right, so. right, so any questions about the map or process with that from anyone? All right, so what is the action? Motion. Okay, so, motion. so we'll entertain a motion for the action to adopt this resolution. Okay, so we have a motion by Randy Powell, seconded by Van Broderick. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much. All right, and then uh, we will now go ahead and if you wanna go back into our work session um, agenda, and uh, we'll just go ahead and pick up right where we left off on number two and with Adam and Kristen. Okay, um, so. We covered that budget adoption process. Can you let Kristen walk us through that calendar? Am I done? Yeah, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, and I wanted to just quickly go through just some of our, our more significant revenues. Um, what we included in your staff report, uh, these, these charts, um, as far as our average annual revenue increase in property tax each year, we are averaging um, about 4.15, the median being about 4.7% increase each year um, over this time period from back into 2006 and seven. Um, and so most of that is new growth. Almost all of it is just new growth. Um, the only time the city in the last 35 plus years that we're aware of has raised property taxes was in that 2008-9 calendar year. Um, excuse me, nine to 10 year. Um, so you can see there was a little bit of a bump here. This was at the, the lowest point in the re Great Recession. Um, we had gone a couple years of decreasing sales tax revenues and it, it was bad. Um, enough that I know our prior city administrator was worried about even making payroll. And so this was a, kind of a last ditch thing that the council at the time uh, chose to do. Uh, this generated about $300,000 in new property tax revenue uh, at the time. And so that is that little more of a bump than you'd see in other years. Um, with the certified tax rate is this next graph. Um, you can see as the, the bottom tail end of this graph, we actually jumped clear back into the 80s and then get more current in year after year as it moves to the right. Um, but the tax rate has gone down, um, except for after the recession, there was a reevaluation of properties, property values started going up substantially and, and so they, they changed some of the rates there. Um, but we currently, uh, as Linden City, um, as far as property tax for um, all of the Utah County cities, have the third lowest property tax rate in Utah County. Um, so we are identified as that blue line there. Um, on average for a home that's valued at $400,000, which we may need to increase that next year on our chart. Um, the median in medium home value just a few years ago off the census was, was 
about 360 and that's certainly changed a lot and so um, but for a home valued at four hundred thousand um, dollars that property tax as far as the city's amount of money that we receive is about two hundred forty five dollars a year so for that two hundred forty five dollars that's intended to help cover plowing public safety parks and rec um, facilities like this that we're meeting in other general fund items uh, that are not funded through a fee or a utility or an enterprise uh, fund so um, any questions on property tax um, as of right now um, with property tax our percentage of our total budget that's dependent on property tax is decreasing every year and we're growing in some areas as far as revenues um, but with property tax we are currently at um, about 10.3 percent of our total city city revenues come from property tax and it's about 18.8 percent of our general fund revenues are from property tax um, so a fairly small comparatively part of the budget uh, only 10% of our funds come from property tax. Um, <clears throat> with sales tax, if we go on to these next charts, um, this top one is showing the uh, these, these bounces are each month. The blue line um, are showing the increases each year or decreases. Let me slide that over here. Um, and again, between that nine and 10 fiscal year, 2009, 10, that was the bottom of the trough with the great recession. We've seen gradual increases. It took six fiscal years for us to get back to about the same sales tax revenue level after the great recession. So something to keep in mind is that sales tax is very volatile during a bad economic time period, and it can take a long time to recover as far as maintaining the same revenue that we may have received previously. So even though the, the recession may be declared over, we, we didn't see the similar level of revenues for six years. From that time, we've increased quite a bit, and then in uh, 2019, 2020 type of time frame, the state required online sales tax revenues. And we saw a huge jump in those last two fiscal years, um, which is very healthy for us. Um, currently, with our current makeup, 24.5% um, of our total city revenues are from sales tax. And 45% of our general fund is from sales tax revenue. So a significant portion of our budget is dependent on successful sales tax. Um, something to keep in mind with that, our top 10 sales tax producing businesses in town make up 50% of our sales tax revenue. So if we lose a Walmart or a Home Depot, we are, we've lost a significant amount of that annual revenue. So just to keep that in mind, um, and I'm, I'm vocally, you've heard me say it before, it makes me nervous that we are so heavenly dependent upon a few businesses' success for the city's success. I'm just conveying that concern to you. So, um, let's see, on increases over time, that other graph, this is just a different way of displaying it. These top two black lines are the most recent two fiscal years, so we've been the highest that we've ever had in sales tax revenues each month for the last uh, two and a half fiscal years. Um, and then some other significant taxes that we receive, funds, revenues, the park tax. This year we're estimating we'll receive over $700,000. Um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, just one item there. We are at the year eight in the park tax revenue, and so it needs to go on the ballot. If you choose to renew that, we would adopt some resolutions and processes 
next year. So this ends in April 2024, and you have to do it, put it on the ballot in the election prior. So in the 2023 general election, the renewal of the park tax will be up. <clears throat> if the voters approve that, then it's good for another 10 years. Um, but for that amount of money that we're putting into different facilities and amenities um, and saving for different projects, that's really critical for us to get that renewed. Um, franchise taxes, energy, and telecommunications are big um, revenue generators, um, over a million, million and a half easily on franchise. Uh, combined and so these are taxes that are collected from utility entities that have been given rights to run their infrastructure in our public streets so a telephone line or a buried cable or um, other companies that are using our public right-of-ways are paying through their customers a fee to use those public spaces now are there rates set by the state just maximum but we can set it within the city as long as it falls under that Okay, and we are currently at the maximum. We are at the maximum the state allows. Okay. Yeah, every every city that I know of has put it at the maximum. All right. So, um, charges for services is a big revenue uh, source, and then utility charges is one of actually our largest single revenue uh, source. But the majority of that is is actually just going to pay for those services, and so um, that is not what I would consider a revenue stream that we're looking to profit from. We are looking to cover operations, maintenance, and replacement. Um, and then we have licenses and permits, and then we, we get some other taxes from the state, such as the gas tax um, for road reconstruction and maintenance. So any questions on sales or property tax? No? OK. A um, couple things. On utility rates, Juan and Noah are working on uh, a updated utility rate study, and preliminarily, um, we are looking at, right now we have a very healthy water fund balance, meaning that after we're covering and saving for some projects, we still have a remaining amount that we can apply to future needs. Um, we would not be looking at charging the current inflationary rates, but stepping that down a little bit because of that healthy reserve. And so tentatively, looking at a 3% increase in water. Um, sewer, we are at a very low fund balance. So um, what I wanted to highlight here, this is really small, we'll see if we can enlarge it. Oh, do you have them? That would be easier. So on that stack of papers that Kristen gave you, yeah, it looks like that. So where we are projecting to end this current fiscal year is approximately $116,000 in our sewer fund balance. So that's meaning we covered all of our costs and we have that much remaining. That doesn't take us very far at all. And so we are concerned about uh, that level. We've had a lot of big projects over the last handful of years. And so this isn't anything that I would look at as, as would we have done something different other than we have a lot of infrastructure projects that are needed. And uh, Mostly in sewer, it's uh, the bond payment for Orem City. Few, and Geneva Road. And sewers at Station 2. Yep, and then sewer at Station 7. Correct. So we are looking, um, our estimate at this point is a 6% increase in sewer, um, and then stormwater at 3%. Um, with another item that is looming, Orem's, we are currently paying a bond for the Orem treatment plan expansion that happened about 10 or 12 years ago, more than that, probably 15 years ago. And they are currently faced with some additional requirements that they have to meet some EPA and state standards. Um, they have about a $12 million um, sewer plant upgrade that is pending. They've bid it out. 
our percentage share in that with we we have a 12 percent share of costs and based on our flows that are planned to go through this the system and so um, their estimate is we would be around 1.5 million of potential costs for that upgrade what is their timeline on that um, that is this next fiscal year. And so what I've talked with them on, they've bid it out and the project came in more than what they had bonded for um, and expected with a lot of other projects. And so um, what we've discussed with them is, is when they finalize um, their project and they may have to narrow the scope of that to fit within their own budget, um, we have asked if we can just annually pay our portion of their bond payment. So that hundred or two hundred thousand dollars a year instead of lump summing one and a half million to them. And they seem very open to entertain that. And so financially that would be good for us. Um, that would be our approach. And so Juan and Noah are trying to factor in those those costs. But just know that, that that's an additional expense that's looming that is a little bit out of our control. What is the life of the current bond remaining? The first position bond. <laughs> on this, um, this February, colored one right there has it on there. Okay. So, 10 more years. Um, so, utility rates a little bit to be determined still. Uh, we're working on those, but we do expect increases in all of our rates. Um, we talked about park tax, debt outlook. That's a good jumping point okay. to that. Yep. So. so there's two sheets for the, oh yes, thank you. There's two sheets for the, for the debt. So the, um, this first sheet lists the different debts and um, Right now, they're all in enterprise funds. Uh, we don't have any in like the general fund or any of the other governmental funds, which would be tax supported. But well, the re the recreation fund has the sales tax revenue bond that's for the aquatic center. Um, so it lists on there um, the original amount of the debt and when it's going to mature and the principal outstanding currently as of today and then there's a graph and it's pretty consistent uh, if you look at 2022 there's a little darker line just at the bottom and that's um, our last payment um, for the Linden View Park it was a $10,000 payment for every year and and now it's paid for that parks really ours <laughs> Um, so our total principal outstanding right now is $12 million and our legal debt limit, the state says we can go into debt up to 4% of our, um, of our taxable value for the city property tax. And, uh, and so that makes it $75 million, which we wouldn't want to do. I mean, that's a limit because I mean, I wouldn't even want to go that close to the limit. So, so right so now we have much greater bonding capacity, obviously. Right. And as long as I've been here, uh, we haven't had a general obligation debt, which is secured by property tax. So it's added on to the property tax. We haven't had that. And so that's, that's good. Um, we've just been getting the, the bonds secured by revenue streams. So, you know, like water secured by water revenue, sewer by sewer revenue. Um, and Yeah, they they are they are locked. Um, so, um, like with Orem, that's you know a special case. Um, the and say the water fund, that's a, a special case where we're going through um, CUP. Um, the the one that would kind of be the the or sorry the 2011 sewer bond as the, through the state and is a pretty good. Um, uh, interest rate. Um, the the one that that you know we probably would look at 
uh, refinancing would be the 2015, the, the one in green for the aquatic center, but that one is um, not callable until 2025. So we have to have it at least 10 years. And that one we did refinance. In 2015. Yeah, because yeah, it so was originally we, we 2008. refinanced once to get a better rate. Mm -hmm. and so it's hard to tell it's 2025, but what, what are the rates now? Yeah. I, I, yeah, on city bonds, I don't know if that's different, but I don't know the answer to that. So you you have a better handle than I do. Mike would as well. <clears throat> yeah, I think Mike would agree that rates rates are trending out. That 2025 will probably be a much higher rate. Yeah. Whether or not we'll be wanting to refinance it or not. Yeah. Great decision to run on that over. Yeah. Just looking at. Any questions on current debt obligations? Overall, this is really minimal. And I mean, we're especially where we have one of them is a 0% interest rate. I mean, that's so, okay. I think managing your debt load really well. I, I think that's great to see. And I love that number. That's a, I, I don't know if you've ever seen that 75,000 or 75 million dollar number. That's a totally that's, oh. that's a great number. <laughs> sure. I do have one quick question. Mm -hmm. So the participate, so we have 12% that we will be responsible for with that capital expenditure for Orem. Will those, so the, you're suggesting a pay-as-you-go uh, participation in their bond, would that come from general fund or the, the sewer, sewer fund? fund? Okay, great. So that's why we're gonna talk about next about some of the proposed. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And that's, that's <coughs> why we're looking at a, a higher sewer percentage increase of that's closer to 6% that would be keeping in line more with inflation, um, but also helping us build enough where we can cover these costs. Yep. Okay. So. Also, Adam, <coughs> when we pay our own city on our monthly base that we will pay for treatment, every year we do a reconciliation of what the actual cost is to treat the sewer. What they do is that reconciliation, if there is additional capital projects, then our fee goes up or down. So years talking to uh, the manager over there they are forecasting doing a few more projects so our fee will increase also we currently pay about thirty five thousand dollars a month for sewage treatment at the sewer treatment, treatment plant mm -hmm. so, and it fluctuates a little bit based on flows um, whether it's a per gallon or a per thousand or million, million, million. million. So, um, any questions on Financial outlook. I, I'm very optimistic. Over the next several years, we've got a couple great things that we think are in the wings. We've got a lot of property still to develop. I, I mentioned, Jake, before you came in, I'm, I'm concerned about we have almost 25% of our revenues are dependent on sales tax and our, our total budget. Um, and, and so I am concerned about the volatility in that. Um, but we have we have a growing business sector, and so I'm optimistic that um, this picture of, of fantastic revenues will, will continue in a decent economy, not necessarily a, a, a great recession again. We, we would be fine for a couple of years, but we would hit that bottom of the trough at some point with our current revenue streams. And so uh, just be mindful of that. I, I want you to be in the know on, on that. Um, but again, I, I feel optimistic with where we're headed and the opportunities that we have for, for continued growth, as long as the legislature doesn't mess with the sales tax distribution formula, because um, that could be catastrophic for us. So, um, okay, any questions? Before we question I had, um, <coughs> sorry, going back to bond, is there any prepayment? I, I know there's a prepay at 2025 yeah. Can you turn on your mic? Bond? Just make it go green. Prepay. Thanks. At 2025, right? We can't we can't refinance it till 2025. Can we pay down principal early? Is there a certain you can't pay any principal early without incurring a penalty? Correct. Okay. So what we did with the 2008 bond that had this, a similar thing um, is we refinanced in 2015 and it went into an escrow account, and so. 
then then when uh, 2018 came, then we used it to pay down the, the 2008. I so we can have Jason Birmingham see if we can do that again uh, at Lewis Young, Robertson, and Birmingham, our financial advisors, and see if if we want to look at securing something now for 2025. Looking at our debt, that's our highest interest rate debt. If we were wanting to pay down a debt early, that's the one that comes to my mind um, that we would look at, especially where there are some ties to sales tax rather right. than right. some the of those utility. from the general fund to the recreation fund to make the debt service payment and something else like that too. We haven't recently asked, two years ago, we asked Lewis Young to, to do a, a look at all of our debt to see if there's anything that would make sense to to refund or refinance, and there wasn't at that time, but we can go through that process again. And so. It does make one wonder, though, if we did make advanced principal payments and put them in an escrow, would we have better use for that money somewhere else? Because we're not going to be getting, yeah, it's, we're not going to be getting any kind of return. Savings account yeah, we we're, we're certainly not getting any return, so there may be some opportunity cost yeah. associated. I mean, we can certainly look at it, but I'm with you. maybe there's some other opportunities. That Let's just circle around back to funding and see what, if, what this Jason thinks about. And then. So the next highest interest rate debt would be the water fund debt. What about that? Does that have prepayment penalties um, or any penalties incurred for extra um, principal payments? I can look into that some more. I, I was told that it was the agreement was to make these payments annually just, you know, because we're paying for the water. And so they wanted it to stretch out, but I can see if. These, these sewer and water ones were done through some state some state provisions through the state agencies where we got better interest rates than we could get in the market. Yeah. And so we'll have to check and see what those contracts say. But I'm not saying we have to do that. I think that's been a strategy of the councils in the past is paying down debt early. I'm not saying we need to, but it'd be nice to know what our options are if we do end up having one of these crazy years where revenues just end up being much higher than we anticipate. Well, and something to keep in mind with those, those are enterprise funds. Right. And so you... In, in my it mind, would be weird to take sales tax dollars and apply right. it to we right. subsidizing I understand that. people's actual yeah. costs yeah. for those services. And so that's, there's not likely that we would have a huge amount of money that we would have as a surplus in those funds that's not pending to go towards right. some infrastructure. Yeah, it's like if you pay off the water fund, then are you using the money that we we're saving for, for wells or something? Yeah. Part of your pro water project. Yeah. So, no, go ahead, Mike. No. Can, can we do that? Are we allowed to use sales tax dollars to pay down the water fund debt? I almost yes. just wonder if by doing that, we would have maybe a year where we didn't have to increase the utility rates because we're saving money there. We without set that up and during the recession, it, it was reversed. We actually had a healthy enterprise fund revenues and we actually the council passed a resolution loaning itself money from the enterprise funds to the general fund to help support us if we needed yeah. we never actually transferred any of that money and used it um, so everything that I remember I don't think we actually pulled the trigger it was in place because it was that bad yeah. but what you're talking about is reverse and so um, we can explore that if you want to do that High level, don't waste a lot of time. I just want to know what our options are. You know, we've raised utility rates every year for eight or nine years. Um, would love to be able to maybe subsidize that with our very, very healthy sales tax revenue. Maybe. I'd just love to know our options. I don't know that I'm proposing anything one way or another, but good to know the options. Okay. We'll, ex we'll explore that. Quick, quick question. I think I know the answer to this question, but on the water or the uh, aquatic center bond, we can't use park. We can't use park money to pay debt service. Is that park correct? Park tax, yes. Park impact fees, no. Um, and we do use a little bit of the park tax. Okay. You could increase that allotment so more is being used from that, but that's that's up to you guys. Yeah, yeah we can discuss that later. I guess we're just looking at options. So. We may have to forego our, you know, our passes that we get every year. 
<laughs> we need to get Mike in there so he can be the biggest customer at the snack shack. <laughs> and your grandkids. <laughs> Um, place to be, it is. Sure. We're we're healthy financially. So, um, moving on, just to, wanted to review and remind you a few years ago, the council asked for employees to participate um, on the health insurance premiums. So we are continuing a three percent employee participation on our monthly health insurance. Um, it's between nineteen and twenty thousand dollars a year that the city um, is is having the employees participate in so um, and that's so we're currently the city's paying 97 percent of the premiums that's something that's that's close uh, we see between 95 and 100 percent of, of most of our counterpart cities that they're for what they're paying uh, for health insurance and and so we feel okay with that, that current status um, and then just to review, we had budgeted for a couple positions, a full-time building inspector and a GIS intern at Public Works. Um, those have not been filled this entire fiscal year, and so those are monies that we'll be able to roll into the general fund that haven't been utilized. Um, they are still looking for inspectors. We're actively getting applications, um, and so Mike and Phil are reviewing that um, as those come in. We're, we're hoping for the right person on the bus. And so with the right experience, that's the big key. We have a lot of applicants that are coming in that don't have very much experience. So. Um, the certifications that they have with, with five plus years as an inspector, something in that range. And so. How many applicants approximately? Oh, um, ever consider kind of an apprentice situation someone that we would help them get certified and shadow and get them prepared mm -hmm. to fulfill the position We, we did, if you recall, a few months ago, we had a market adjustment that we made with a building inspector position, and we did create a building inspector levels one, two, and three, so we could hire somebody at a level one. That's an entry level that would get certified within six months. So we're set up to be able to do that if needs be. Um, I think the, the question for Phil and Gary is training and time on the job, and I think. But maybe the five years experience could be <coughs> more flexible. So we'll we'll keep we'll keep working on that. So our, our intent is to carry that forward as as a position into this next fiscal year and keep trying to fill that. So um, and then, just an FYI, we're, we're continuing to track from a few years ago when we brought an engineer in-house, um, those third-party engineering expenses. Um, and I know Noah's continuing to look at that. And uh, we love having mm -hmm. Noah and Trent in-house. Uh, it has been so much more efficient, uh, more productive. Um, it's been a great move. And so, uh, a good thing for us. Some future savings and efficiencies, things uh, Juan is working on a sewer system cleaning process. Maybe you can explain that sewer rat process. <laughs> we don't have a sewer so, rat problem, let's clarify. Yeah. So the sewer rat is a, a system where we actually don't have to go in, inside the sewer lines with a PV truck. We just do it with a acoustic sound wave and depending on how easy the, the wave goes through, we're able to tell if the line has problem or not. So we were able to, to do the entire city last year. We 
were able to identify about 25 points as we just went to, to have our specific eye on them. And then this year we focused uh, to only do half of the city and then we'll just kind of go back and forth. But that saves uh, a lot of time on, on the personnel and equipment as we're able to use our personnel to do more of the stormwater and other duties. I just love watching how we can come so efficient in the department. You just do such a wonderful job with your staff and, and your staff does such an amazing job in return. So And bringing the high tech. I agree with you guys. Have yeah. done so many good things for me. Thanks, Mom. Um, secondary water meters, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but just in, later in our agenda here, but just as um, an item that, that does save water resources, and we're looking at these auto-read functions on these future meters um, where it would radio in the meter reads and save us from having to go out and look at those with, with an individual employee. Um, do, do we know kind of the life expectancy of those meters? About 20 years. That's all? Yeah, that's, that's, like that, 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 that's like nothing in, I don't know, maybe it's just an age I've gotten to. Yeah, so 20 years is nothing now. So we come <laughs> quite, quite a, quite a ways. You've got to think about how long you'll be in 20 years. Uh, well, I mean, hopefully. The, 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 I'll be in 20 years. Well, I'm just a couple that of That is accurate years. reading. It's, it's 20 years. Then after that, we have to start doing some maintenance. We have to replace some of the batteries. But the actual metering uh, equipment, it's, it loses very little efficiency. Hey, can you turn on your mic, Juan? Yeah. Might help you with this. Maybe if we all trim one since we're done yeah, my, If my dishwasher can't last more than two or three years. Uh, yeah, yeah these, are, these are 20 years <laughs> life that it's uh, guaranteed. And then after that, we start to start replacing my goal is to start replacing uh, like a tenth every year with the culinary system because that's the old you know once we get the the <clears throat> the secondary water meters installed then start doing that uh, retrofit of the of the culinary meters and then we also go to the automatic reads and more reliable uh, and then the, the customers can actually get the readings on their on their phones and get better information how to save water. Um, let's see, community development. Mike, do you want to talk about that permit tracking software? That's been great for you. So. Great. I know <laughs> yeah. that's helpful. I know a lot of citizens, that's always the biggest situation is like, where am I at? When am I going to hear from them next? And so saving that phone call, staff time answering the phone, and they can digitally go on. That's great. Uh, jump into that next page, the chart there with the grants that we were awarded in the last uh, fiscal year ish um, $1.8 million in grants that our employees w went out and tried to obtain and were successful in. Uh, and then in addition, we received uh, about 656,000 in the uh, American Recovery Plan Act, the ARPA funds. Um, and so those are the federal monies that we were hoping to use as our match on that secondary water meter and grant. Um, so very successful. Uh, the last 18 months or so on, on grants for employees, so kudos to their efforts. Uh, a lot of work goes into those. And most of the work is on the tail end after they're awarded. It's a lot of reporting, a lot of tracking. Um, that's when the projects actually start. And so um, it's, it's a great effort, though, that they put in. Um, I mentioned kind of increased in new revenues. We're, we're very optimistic on sales tax, building permits. We'll continue to see revenues come in as new construction occurs. 
Uh, it's, it's very healthy in all sectors, our residential, commercial, retail, office, industrial, we're seeing projects across the board. Um, that will taper off at some point in time as we get closer to build out. Um, and then impact fees, same thing, that will start to taper off because those are collected at build out. But as those new projects come in, we'll see some revenues in stormwater, water and sewer, and then public safety impact fee, I didn't list there. Um, we are working on an update to stormwater, water and sewer. Juan, maybe you can give us 30 second update on that. So. Yeah, they're all uh, to be completed uh, new this fall. And uh, we have uh, some site analysis and also operating system projects that are needed to carry out the uh, agreement. And it doesn't mean an increase in rates. We were kind of surprised on the last one that we did. We actually saw some decreases in our impact fees because of the amount of infrastructure we had already improved upon. And so we can only collect on that incremental growth basically that um, is needed for new development new yeah, to accommodate new residents. So, um, Any questions on any of that so far? Do you have a public safety impact fee? We do have a public safety impact fee that we adopted when we built the public safety building. And so... And is that being set in stone? That is not, that is just another impact fee that we collect for. And with that one, even with the building being paid off, we can continue to collect that and pay ourselves back for the portion that the impact fee should have covered. So. And what is that now? On how much it is per building permit or? No, on the two months or so, or two months ahead. I don't know that off the top of my head. I can find that out, I'll shoot you an email. Okay. Um, um, really quickly uh, before we go on to the next segment. So does anyone want to take a quick restroom break, be able to grab dessert, anything like that? Get up, turn the heater on. Turn it <laughs> off? Up, 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 up. up. They're like, no. <laughs> You're okay? All right, anybody just step out and use the restroom or grab some cake if you want to, so. Um, Personnel issues, uh, from, from here on out on this agenda, I want you to keep in mind, we are at a point right now where department heads have submitted everything in the pot. And from here, we are going to be narrowing things down. So keep in mind, this is, this is big picture issues that could come up in the budget. Um, things that, that are high level and may likely be pared down. So. Don't freak out on me, that's what I'm asking, so, okay? Um, so, police, let's start, Chief, if you wanna give us a rundown on a couple needs that we've discussed recently on personnel. Okay, so, within the past two weeks, I had a younger officer submit his resignation. He accepted a position for a couple dollars more an hour and further vacation accrual opportunities. So he's going up to another jurisdiction. Uh, that being said, that was after the 6% that we got, so we got that. So we do have a opening, a position open there. That transforms into Karen, who we've got in the academy. And let me just tell you, give you a brief update on, on her. Uh, thank you for supporting that, that decision. She is phenomenal. She's leading the pack in the academy on many levels. I've got nothing but positive feedback related to her. However, she still doesn't graduate till towards the end of April and then begins a full-time field training officer program, which takes several months to complete. So I have a vacancy now. I wouldn't be able to fill that vacancy with her probably until August. Uh, I want to feel comfortable with her as our department. She wants to be comfortable on her own. So usually that FTO program is a little lengthy, but she's doing a great job. We're excited for her. Chief, that leaves. Chief, and just to clarify, from what I understand, she can't work solo. She has to kind of Yeah, shadow. correct. I apologize. Let me back up. Yeah, so, so the Law Enforcement that. Academy, there's two blocks. She's finished the first block, which certified her to perform certain duties. But she has to be with somebody 24-7 to, to do most law enforcement functions. 
At the end of April, she graduates the Law Enforcement Academy block and becomes fully certified. But then at that point, she's still in our field training program, has to be with an officer for at least a month, two months before we let her go on her own and shadow her to make sure she's up to speed, all liability, officer safety, policy and procedures. So it takes some time. So we do have an open vacancy as of March 3rd, which is next week. Uh, that would put us in a, in a several month hole. It would be detrimental to a team to try and uh, pull in overtime, fill shifts, try to utilize the, the few reserves we have right now. Uh, and it'd be a huge impact to try and fill that with her at this point. So what I'm proposing is, is we fill that position with a, another officer I anticipate within the next year. We may have a retirement, we may lose another one. Uh, so I'd like to, to fill that position plus request funding to put Taryn full-time temporarily for up to a year until that vacancy occurs and she fills that hole for us. Uh, the way things are, I can't honestly tell you if I'm gonna lose one, two, uh, hopefully we, we stay consistent with the people we have at this point. But So those are my you manpower have had issues. somebody indicate retirement and has already talked to us in the next 12 to 18 months about that. So. Yeah, we do have an officer that's reaching that milestone uh, 20 year mark that has indicated potentially he, he wants to go into another field and start a program. So that's, that's kind of where we're at with our, with our positions now. Um, with, with her <coughs> wages and benefits, that's probably in the 70 to 80,000 a year range. Um, that if we carried that for, for six or 12 months, that would probably, well, if that was for a full year, would be about where we're at until we could slide her into a vacancy. But she'd be always in the hole instead of going out into recruit. Absolutely. Yep. And so, I, I, I mean, when we have a vacancy, it seems like it takes us two or three months to get through the interview process and hiring somebody new and they get, the, get their notice. And, and so just keep in mind, this is, this is worst case scenario in that 70 to 80,000 range. But, um, I, uh, I, <laughs> I've been around in this career for a while and I've seen officers come and go and uh, I think this is a, a unique opportunity. She, she had submitted an application to a couple other agencies and withdrew those to stay. Uh, so I think, I think we've got a good one to hold on to. So I've, I've told the chief the intent, if, if the council's <clears throat> okay with, with this concept, the intent is that we're not increasing the number of officers in a permanent basis, that this is a temporary option to get the right person in when that vacancy occurs. And so unfortunately, the, the timing's just not exactly there, but what's your guys' thoughts? Those are warm fuzzies for me. I, I think they're pleased with that. <coughs> Really, the entire labor market, but especially police, for whatever reason, um, they don't like it because of their personnel support of it. I think it's kind of right. People are blessed and to be able to have to do that. Um, so for me, I, I personally think the police mm -hmm. should be happy too. But <laughs> yeah, and I think I think the whole purpose, <coughs> kind of our objective with the cadet program and sponsoring that, and maybe even you know, reaching down to these youth that are even doing the police academy is we need to expect sort of a natural progression if we can retain and sort of stack our own talent pipeline, have it have it loaded in advance. So there will naturally be some overlap if we're going to retain that talent. So Yeah, I, you know, I put Taryn on, I documented, and uh, she's great, but I don't want to just, I don't want to exclude the other caliber of people that we have in the department. It's, it's an incredible group of, of men and women that, that uh, yeah, they're worth sticking. One of them got spit on last week and he's still here, so there's gotta be something good to say to that. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. We'll, we'll, as we get closer to that, we'll be bringing that forward then as an action item. Um, let's see, Public Works. Juan, you wanna run through a few of those? Yeah, uh, Public Works, we, uh, had one of my guys give me his two weeks notice this week and uh, I'm just advertising again to, to get me a replacement for him if that's I can. 
On the streets department, we have tried it for a whole year trying to merge this, the, the water and the streets department where the water department is constantly digging on the street. It's only fair that they help us fix the streets. But we're having uh, enough leaks to, to just constantly be doing those. And uh, the patching and, and the streets have uh, taken a back seat to that. So I'm proposing getting a, uh, and we couldn't get any, any seasonals last year. We, we applied, we, we advertised, and we didn't get a single application. So my recommendation is to uh, hire for an entry level, a full-time <coughs> position to help in the streets department, and then we can start grooming them to, to be moving into other, other places in the city from there and uh, keep trying to, to get some of those seasonals to help uh, with additional summer, summer work. I also want to create some uh, upward mobility within the departments because a lot of the, the, the complaints that I get from my personnel is, well, I'm here, but I have nowhere, nowhere to move up above. So I was proposing doing a, uh, the superintendent, a lead, and, uh, and then maybe an operator one and two to, to be able to hire them at the lower level and then working them through the ranks as time goes, goes on. So we'll, we'll look at some costs on those. We haven't gotten to that level to get the numbers on those items yet, but we'll evaluate that and bring that up again. So just how wanted to be aware of that. That from what we're doing right now, I thought you'd set up some of those. How much we, we've have, we have set it up on, uh, <coughs> on the sewer. We have a superintendent and a lead. In uh, streets, we just have one lead person. So doing the same thing, but now into another one. Right. In in water. In water. In storm water, we're not gonna <coughs> we're not gonna do the upward mobility, but in uh, in uh, water and uh, streets and sewer, I think we have to create some additional positions. I have a random question. Just a thought that came to mind. Uh, the seasonal employee that would be like a level one in the in the department focused on water. Um, Keith, you have a couple guys that are get stretched thinner and thinner as we have more and more parks and they have to deal with the water issues in the parks or the sprinklers are a big job every year and um, they're trying to fix the sprinklers same time that the pool is getting going. Would you ever envision this person being able to help? Do, do those two areas ever collaborate when you're dealing with water issues in our city properties and parks versus street? Definitely uh, collaborate a lot, uh, even uh, with the cemetery. And when I need help, I ask Keith's guys. And when Keith needs help, uh, we already kind of help each other in, in, in different projects. But uh, definitely, if we have a, a project, we, we don't want to sit idle. We always like to. Right. To so this person could potentially do some crossover water issues. They could be put to. I think it's possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Over here. I think it's very possible. How it works now is is just about as good as it could get. I mean, if I have an issue or something, he he won't send me one person to cross over. He'll send me people that can come help me, okay. and then we get it done. So Wonderful. there's plenty of movement both ways. So I don't know if we would assign somebody half there and then half to come help us. Yeah. We're, we do You're have a great yeah. We already. have a great team and awesome. spirit going there. So. <laughs> yeah, when I when we were doing the cemetery uh, re-landscaping there on the, on the entrance, uh, Keith was in the middle of getting all the parks going, and I had to get the cemetery for Memorial Day, and all I had was Jake come and say, okay, do this, do this, do this. He'd line us up, and then we, we'll get it all done. And So with knowledge and, and some shared labor, we, we get it done. Um, Mike, we had, we had brought this up last year and just kind of gotten some general feedback in the community development um, building department specifically is where it kind of ended up last year. Um, but Mike's going to give us an overview of code enforcement. We had asked about a position and I think the, the feeling at that time was generally the council was comfortable with how we were with code enforcement in general, but we're bringing that up again to see. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of talk about I put together uh, some graphs here that shows historically what we've done with code enforcement. Um, how, you know, how many cases per year? You go 
can see on that graph where we've been proactive in code enforcement and when it's, when it's uh, just reactive. So in our department, mainly it's myself and Mary, we do most of the code enforcement for the city, like as far as you know, uh, home occupation, snow removal, landscaping, animal com complaints, resident, um, as far as like enforcing stuff, police help us with that as well. Um, nuisance, code violations. Um, so everything that Mary and I do is, is all reactive. We get a complaint from a resident. Um, right now we do, on average, 40 to 50, 55 cases a year. Um, and so what we're looking at is, you know, is, is the city happy with the current level of code enforcement? Um, we do spend, a, not a significant, but we do spend quite a bit of time doing code enforcement on reactive stuff. Um, is there interest in the council looking at a part-time, if, if we can even find a part-time person to help us with code enforcement? Um, that person would also help with business licensing. Uh, there's a lot of businesses out there that we just don't, aren't able to go around and see who has a business license or, or, or don't. Right? Um, when I was with South Salt Lake, that's how I got my whole start in city government was I was interning with South Salt Lake. They gave me a list of the 2,000 businesses in the city and I went out and found out who was, lic who was licensed and who wasn't. Found 200 businesses that weren't licensed. And, um, and so you know, that person, the code enforcement officer, would help with, uh, with that. So um, it, it would take a stress off of Mary and myself, especially with some other projects we want to we wanna do with uh, updating the general plan, updating the commercial design standards, updating some of our an antiquated codes that um, and, and before that, I just wanted to, Phil Brown wanted to, he, he felt very strongly about this as well, and he had some things he wanted to share. He just um, talked about he feels there's a really high need for this. Um, they've let some things slide for a long time as they've had to kind of focus on priorities and let other things slide there. And he's, he says, our planners and inspectors cannot spend time doing code enforcement that needs to be done and try to review, issue, and inspect new development and construction. We have been short-staffed way too long with no end in sight. So he he feels very strongly this is an important issue, as, um, as do I. I think um, there's been people in the community who have noted, hey, you know, this business is looking trashy or this residence, you know, there's, there's issues. And Mike and Mary have done a fantastic job, like, you know, when they hear something getting on it. But it'd be really nice to have someone that can kind of float and take care of these things. And if we do it, I'd love to hear ideas on maybe getting a name that's a little more community friendly than code enforcement officer. But anyway, what is, I'd love to hear from council on their thoughts that's on That's always been something that's been really important. I think a yeah. high quality um, city, make sure that you have somebody that can answer those. And staff has done a wonderful job. Yes. But I also feel like you're wearing too many hats for that. I think that you, what you do best is is you shouldn't have to be doing this, I guess. I feel like we should have another staff member. I realize employees are hard to come by, but I think that we need to make some sort of a genuine effort to try to um, accomplish the um, opportunity to make help our city shine where it needs to shine. And um, yeah, I, I, I I'm full heartedly support. And just to clarify, this is that's. the department's asking for part time, not a full time. Yeah, how many hours? I was going to ask. How many hours are you thinking? Twenty hours a week. Walk me through the timing and kind of what happens when a complaint regarding a code thing comes in. Walk me through what you guys do, yeah. what's kind of the process, how much follow up. Yeah, so two of them we're dealing with right now. Um, I've been working on the one, uh, there's a building right west of the 7 Eleven down here on 700 North. We had two Jeep frames just sitting out there on 700 North. Months, uh, they've got triple cars. Cars are triple parked and auto parked outside. So um, I got a complaint about that one. Basically, you're going down there, taking pictures, coming back, write, researching the codes, writing a letter, um, <laughs> mailing that, giving them the 28 days, going back in 28 days, inspecting it, writing another code enforcement letter, giving them five more days. So, you know, I, I, prob I probably spent 
with the inspections and everything, I've, I've probably spent three, four hours on that, just that one issue. Mary's working on a patio over here. They've got two, there's structures they've built on the back that are illegal and you know, she's probably spent you know, that same amount of time. So weeds, you know, those will take us time to go out there. We've, we've got a kind of a form letter just for weeds and send it out. That's 30 minutes or so, but some of these bigger bases, they, they take quite a while. Uh, uh, how responsive are people with the first letter, if you will? And um, yeah, it just depends. Um, it, it's all over the board. Like, like the one on 700 North, they were very responsive. Now I'm still working with them, um, but they, they were responsive. You know, we're working with uh, Stephen Fryer on 700 North on his yard that's full of junk, and that one has been really hard. We spent a lot of time on that one. Officers are over there today because for someone living in the camp today as well. Um, is this what the panda head is? Uh -huh. yeah. okay. Depends on the severity yeah. of the issues. And so if there's costs associated, then yeah, we're we're at the point where we're working with Brian and threatening litigation and Yeah, and just it, trying to get an override yeah, idea it's kinda, of what it does. Because in the past when we've approved that other building inspector position, it was to be that they were gonna pick up some of that. We just haven't been able to fill the position. Yeah. So it wasn't like we were saying no, yeah. but we've always been, at least from my standpoint, a little uncomfortable with you're our full-time hammer, even though this is a part-time suggestion. Right. Can't touch this. Part-time. <laughs> well, well, Mike, I, I'm thinking, um, obviously, we couldn't expect those people to justify their salary by getting business licenses that normally wouldn't come in and things like that. But I, th I think it would certainly, in my mind, be worth the time and the effort, if nothing more than to free you folks up. Because having sat in on the DRC meetings and discussions and so forth, no, and it's only going to get, depending on your perspective, it's only going to get better. Uh, but in a very real sense, worse in the sense of time commitment and so forth. So I think it's reasonable to I think it's certainly reasonable to uh, allow someone to come in and take that position and let them run with it. And I, I don't know if we can find somebody part time, but we're willing to look. We don't know. You know, we, we're trying to find some comparisons on what what that would cost. Uh, I don't, I should have mentioned this earlier when we talked about the building inspector, but Bill called me from the conference he's at, and a lot of cities are are moving their code enforcement officers that are really good working with the public over to be building inspectors. So it's kind of it's a natural yeah. answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it would be really great to be in a spot where instead of only reacting to complaints, there could be someone that who's just a community city liaison advocate that's more proactively addressing things and working with individuals in a, in a good manner to before they're really a big problem. I see that most folks that are part-time are that are in as um, the assistant planner. So th there's ways to dovetail those into some of the utilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not to say that we want to do that with May, but I think getting somebody in, then they, we can find a new home for them if we need to later. So it basically be an hourly position. Yeah. 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 And my thought is, I, I'm jealous of your time and Mary's as well. I don't want you guys doing that. I think you guys do that. I also want to have a balance of, I don't want to be that thing that is the snappy, that is just going after people. I've got some neighbors that illegally park and it's bothering me. they've got a lot of kids that, that will go in and, and so finding a balance of I don't want to be this heavy handed city that is just going after code enforcement is crazy uh, but you know there's, there's a lot of blatant ones as well that I think yeah, yeah let's, let's call those out let's just go back to part time I think yeah, that you wouldn't the part time it doesn't seem like the right number mm -hmm. to this that way we can be reactionary and then jump on some of these big ones that are it does come down to the personality of you know, trying to be yeah. community minded, but also there's ones that you do have to bring the hammer, right? Yeah. So, yeah, like the Friars, I mean, that's been an ongoing case, and we do have to be tough with that one. Yeah. Like, I, I, I've had building inspectors before that were very ticky tacky, like, I need to hand this paper back. He's mm -hmm. off. Huh? Someone's <laughs> missing a tile from the, you know, yeah. 
So no, that's not if you mm -hmm. uh, that's not an issue. So you might have to double check. Yeah. It appears on here the business license holder is only an effort to post the course in twenty twenty one. It shouldn't be intimidating or unwanted or or no success or whatever. Um, I would assume that you're doing hundreds of businesses that don't have a license and it should be a process then of getting to them and, and helping to justify that position. Um, but I'm also interested what how is this spike in 2014 issue? So it looked like the planners had just there wasn't much follow up. All they did was just send out lead notices and uh, landscaping notices. So all uh, the folders just chuck full of of just uh, courtesy notices, but there isn't any follow up on there. So I don't know if they actually ever got. We had a couple years where Gary, our building inspector, was also working on the lead abatement aspect, and so he was very active as he would go out doing inspections of them following up and sending lead abatement letters. And so, but that certainly has fizzled off. Is that when we hired Brandon from Spanish Fork too? Or from Springville? Oh, the pro he's, he's now property owned from LP. Oh, Jordan Coleman. Jordan he sent most of those out in uh, 2014. I think we could do it in a positive way. I, I think we get the right person in there and, you know, we can <coughs> share them with our vision of what we want London to be and help them to understand that in a very real way they're, they're helping the citizen. Yeah, just depends on who we get in there. Well, great. That's wonderful. Thank you, Council, for supporting that. And so I guess from here we would determine what is um, a cost, uh, just a analysis of what the competitive rate would be. And Take a look at numbers and okay. see if there's other options. And Okay. Just because we're leaving that, so we had under 50 that we responded to last year. And if the most is four hours-ish, Those were reactive. I know I sent a couple, I got some calls from some citizens on, and Mike then did a great job of getting them fixed, but they were purely reactive. I mean, I don't think they would have had the opportunity to drive by and say, oh boy, they're violating the. Yeah, we've never known the one about all the. The lumber, the lumber the wood, firewood. firewood, and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, and I think that speaks to Phil's point. He feels like there's catch up to do, and then someone who just kind of keeps things currently, you know, humming along to. I think 2020 was great because everybody worked on their yards because they were all home, they were working from home, so. And we could volunteer and like have our yards get really messy and stuff, just give them something to do. Yeah. I will just say it out loud, I'm a little worried about this about doing too much, too heavy handed. I want our city to be great, but I do not want somebody driving around trying to find something. I think the nice thing about our ordinance, too, you have to give a 28-day notice, courtesy notice. You can't just go give them a citation or something like that. You, you've got to give almost a month of just a courtesy notice to do something. So. And then if they make any effort, <coughs> we have agreements that extend that time out. And it's pretty well written in our ordinance. We're not going to do the whole thing now. But, uh, That's the very reason I would love to get ideas to not have the title be code enforcement yeah. officer. I would like it to be more of a community preservation, preservation development, uh, yeah, protection officer or something that's more officer. friendly, doesn't put people on the defensive and someone who is, like you're saying, not going to every last, you know, detail of, you know, picking things apart. But there's definitely, I mean, there's things, I mean, we all know there's businesses on State Street that have had broken fencing for years, some of them. Yeah. Or they've let all their landscaping die and they haven't replaced it. Or, you know, things like that that just really affect the quality of life here in our community. And 
hopefully someone that can go in and have a friendly exchange because I think it has to have a, yeah. a welcome wagon kind of a yes, feel to exactly. it that, we'll it, need to that find you're the coming right in and having a relationship with the offender and helping them understand how how they need to I don't know polish things up for their own benefit as well as the community. Right. So. Well, it'd be interesting to see too. I mean, I'm not suggesting that they would necessarily run out of opportunities, but if, you know, they get to the point where they are just looking for stuff, making stuff up, I mean, it could be a part-time temporary position just to see how it goes. You know, just say, okay, at the end of this period of time, if things go well, we'll consider. And unfortunately, in today's economy, a part-time person. Yeah, that's true. But we'll look at some options. So. Okay. Well, they have oversight, so it's not like they would get out of hand. Yeah, oversight and prioritization and programming and mm -hmm. <coughs> frankly, if we really wanted to, we could probably hire three full-time people to go after all our illegal aid youth. I mean, it would take that many people to, <coughs> but I don't think that's something we, we want to go after. And so by organization. Well, we want to kick your mother-in-law out, Jake. That's your leader. <coughs> Move on. I think we've gotten good feedback. Thank you. Um, Keith, do you want to give an overview on this item yes, that you're looking um, at? Uh, with, the, with the beginning caveat that I, I feel like the council has been a great support for the Aquatic Center, and I know we're trying to, to do better all the time and things are going up, but uh, I've, I've been for the couple, last couple of years trying to evaluate what is what to do with Alan's position when he leaves and if he leaves, sometimes it looks like he just keeps staying and staying. But he's in, mentioned to me last year uh, his his desire to to maybe have some some help that knows the system instead of hiring everybody in the beginning of the year. If he had a part time coordinator who would also help with us with our other things uh, during the summers and, and the winters. Um, probably working 40 hours a week in the summer and then maybe two days in the winter helping us that that he feels like that could really help two reasons first reason is it'd be nice for me if if when Alan leaves that I have someone that knows the system besides me uh, even though it's a part-time situation and then the second reason is to alleviate some of Alan's burdens so I, I was and I'm in the same boat as everybody else with Mike I don't know if I can even find a said person but uh, I'd really like to investigate and go out and see if I can find a, a part-time rec coordinator like we've got over there, Balin, who's a student, and, and Jamie, who's a, a mother, who, who has, you know, Elizabeth Christensen would have been great. You know, Elizabeth was looking for something part-time and at the pool like that where she could have some longevity. But something like that that can take some of the burden uh, off Alan where he can have them doing tasks during the winter so when 120, 125 people are hired in the spring, you know, Alan does all their new hire paperwork. He, he tries to get these kids on. He's got to train those that are going to help him, trying to get him a little bit of, of, of help, security. And, and that's what we identified as maybe one of the greatest needs uh, for, for the pool and, and for the recreation programming. Keith, can you share a little bit about just the hours that Alan is pulling? <clears throat> yeah, I'd love to. Alan... Um, and I, I will caveat this too. Alan does an amazing job. He is motivated by work. He work. He work. He's a workaholic. So sometimes he, he does it to himself. But during the summer, you know, he's working sixty-hour weeks regularly, and that's seven days a week. And he took one little vacation last summer, and got called twice because the pool's been out of balance. And although Alex has been a great help, and Alex has a pool certification now, as well as I do, um, there is so much to do from April to, to September, October, really. Uh, he, is, he works that many hours, and he is uh, um, exempt, so he's not eligible for overtime, which that's what I say. Which, which is probably a little bit of a benefit to the city because he is a little bit hard to control with what he wants to work and what he's willing to work, but he has full ownership of that pool. And uh, for four, three or four years, I've been, I've been saying, is this your last year, is this your last year? 
He loves it. I don't know what he's going to do, but he will eventually leave me I, unless there's an upward mobility spot for him. Uh, it's probably not a full career path to be an aquatics supervisor, aquatics manager. Uh, but yeah, he just overdoes it and outdoes himself. And he just was so burned out last year and from COVID, uh, the COVID year prior, that uh, he just needs help. And it can be me over there helping him. And I, I try to do as much as I can with my other responsibilities. But what we get out of Balin and Jamie to help Hannah with recreation programming is, is just immeasurable what we can do. So yeah, he's, he's well, I think he's worth it, but not only that, he's willing to work the hours to get stuff done. So that would be my request, a part-time 20 hour a week. Uh, we, we, we figure it'd be 25 to $30,000 a year okay, to get that, that something done. If we can find the right person right now, there's about nine big time pools in, in Utah, but also even in Pleasant Grove that have lost their managers. And the reason is, is because it's too much. It's too hard to hire all the kids. And Pleasant Grove's manager, uh, pool manager, just left to the private industry to uh, become the general manager of Pack Cats. Mm -hmm. And so he's left the government work completely. And Pleasant Grove reclassified his job to an assistant department director to try to attract somebody to come in and run that pool. So we're really pretty lucky to have Alan. And when that day comes, We'll just do the best we can, but uh, uh, Tooele County, several in Salt Lake County, all these pool folks are quitting uh, because it's just too tough to manage all these kids and try to keep them working. So we'll, we'll evaluate numbers as we move forward here in the next few weeks and months. Any, any significant heartburn over that? Or we're not asking for a yes or no, no we're tonight. We're just yes, looking. Just this is just general feedback. Um, I'm going to see more about the size of the proposed fund. <coughs> oh, on the I mean, agenda? Yeah. Yeah, Mike, you've got to go at 7.50, you said? Okay. We're on quick. the home stretch here, I think. So um, moving on. I'm going to pass this around. I emailed the council members a copy of this. And we had a couple, couple really minor typos, and so ignore your email, and we'll go off of this. This is um, our recommendations based on our most recent merit um, study, salary study. And what I would like to do, I want to carefully manage expectations, and um, I would like to collect this paper back from you after tonight. And... Um, being because until you make a decision, this is draft, and um, there's some comparisons here that we would like to manage those carefully. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. um, so where we were at, um, Chase did a great job um, in our finance department, has helped a lot with our, our study um, we anticipate starting off with COLA. We did this 6% increase in January. Uh, that caught us up to the market fairly well in most positions. Um, we evaluated without that 6% increase, um, we would have been over 40, about 45% of our positions would have been more than 5% below market average. And so it, it made a significant difference um, brought a lot of positions in line with where they needed to be. Um, my expectation, we'll, we'll continue to watch inflation, um, but my expectation is we will probably not be recommending any additional COLA um, as part of the budget this process this year. Um, and Alan, could you, when you said where we need to be, could you please el eliminate that to be at the midpoint? We're not looking to yes. drive the wage or... Yep, I'm going to show you here. Hopefully this helps. Um, so if you look at this graph up here on the screen, um, what we are shooting for on these salary studies is we are looking not at their current hourly rate, but we start with looking at the range. So we say, okay, if you're hired at range, whatever, range 12 in our pay scale, you would start at $20 an hour, and after 12 steps, you would be making $35 an hour. 
So we take the midpoint in that range and we compare with the midpoint of, of we're trying to hit at least six comparable cities of our similar size or cities that have a similar job function. So a police officer is one that from most of the cities in Utah County, regardless of their size, an officer is doing very similar duties in Provo, Orem versus Linden. Um, but other things like a supervisor or a department head, uh, we would not compare with some of those larger cities because of the size difference and the supervisory capacity, the budget difference. So we're trying to find good comparables. We do a lot of research and get all that data from the cities. Our goal is to be within plus or minus 5% of the peak on that graph. And so right now that one is almost at zero. So it's a negative 0.84. And so the midpoint on that range is where the peak is in that chart. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, so with, with this, what this is saying is if this is a person's, they ended up just a little, not quite 1% below midpoint, um, in the market, they are making, their range is better than 47% of other comparables. It's less than 52% of other comparables that we looked at. Um, this would be an example of one where this was greater than, more than 5% below midpoint. So it was more than 5% below that mid spot, meaning 70, almost 74% of our comparables are paid higher than they are in their range. And so our goal is to be within plus or minus five. So this would be one that we would have recommended a, an adjustment. So we would move their range up and get as close to zero as we could. Um, this would be, this last one would be an example of one where we wouldn't make a change if it will scroll for me. Um, so this one is a 6.79% more than midpoint. Um, so meaning that they are, are paid better or equivalent to 77% of those that we compared with, but they're still in the market. 22% of those comparables are making more than they are. So our goal is to be at that middle spot plus or minus a little and not drive the market. We don't want to be leading that where everybody's trying to jump us. However, we've been faced with some positions such as with police, building inspectors, engineers, and a few of the other uh, public works jobs that it's very competitive right now where our pay has to be for us to be more competitive further on to that right. So the midpoint is further in the right of that scale. Does that visually, does that help kind of where? Okay. So from some of that data then, what we did is we looked at those ranges and the steps that the employees were in in the range. Um, on this chart that we've handed out to you, the box at the bottom is all within the police department. Um, and then those that are on the top are, are non-public safety. Um, the majority of our recommendations um, are within, again, financially within the police department, about 86% of these costs are within the police. We're seeing just a lot of pressure there even after this 6% increase that we gave. We had an officer go to another agency for a couple dollars more. And so um, with that percentage that I identified um, there, so in this column right there, it says proposed range midpoint. Um, there is a set of numbers right, right there. Um, most of them are between zero and a negative three on the top, and then on the police section, kind of a one to 2.9%. Does everybody see that? Those are the percentages the midpoint will end up after this move um, compared to other comparables in our market. So, so what we would like to recommend is shifting these positions a little bit higher than average in public safety because of those pressures that we're seeing in the market. In other areas, non-public safety, we're, we're within that threshold of the minus 5%, but we're not pushing over that midpoint. Um, all the other positions that we looked at in the city, um, there was another chart that I emailed you, it had some red and yellow 
Uh, anything that we were recommending changes on were highlighted in red. Um, yellow was if it was three to 5%, so it's kind of a, hey, we're gonna watch this. Um, but, um, sorry, that was getting in the, the weeds a little bit, just to tell you our methodology. Um, bottom line, what we would like to do um, is recommend March 7th at our next council meeting that we bring this forward to you as an official action item. And for this remaining fiscal year, if we were to implement these changes, um, it would be about $24,200, and 21 of that is out of the police department. Um, and then for the remainder 12 months next fiscal year, this would be about 72, 73,000 a year. Um, given our good financial standpoint right now, we're, we're confident that this can be met uh, as a, with an ongoing basis. Um, comments, thoughts on this? 26% increase. <coughs> I should have that in front of me. Do you remember what that was? Just see if we can find that in that staff report for me. Yeah, what 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 I would identify is um, on this uh, the the thing that we're looking back on is our fund balance and general fund. And so where we were this, I found it right. So we were projecting last June, that we would end our current fiscal year with three and a half, almost 3.6 million in fund balance. Um, with the majority of these changes being in the police department, um, so when you're looking at that, this is after we've covered all of our projects and our needs and we're putting money away for certain things that we have a balance of 3.6 million. We think we'll be better than that with sales tax revenues, how positive they are. And so adding that additional three or 400,000 is, is really coming out of this pool of money. We don't do that. So with positions, we are very specific looking at cities that have comparable size and comparable duties. And so... And you'll shift that if you need to and take half of a, a position. I've, I've seen your charts on that and you're, you're very specific, specific about the duties versus the size of the city. I've seen those. Correct. And so we are trying to do a, a very apples to apples comparison. And so... In fact, we went through and, and we're, we're a member of a, a software program that a lot of other cities enter this data in. And so they are putting it in and it shows when they updated it and how much their ranges are. And so we're able to get a lot of good data. And then we are throwing out Park City and Salt Lake City and, and trying to stay focused within just Utah County. Um, but in most positions, we're throwing out Provo Orm and sometimes Lehigh and Draper because they're right on that cusp of Salt Lake County and where they're getting pressure from Salt Lake County wages. And so we're, we're trying very hard to make an apples to apples. I appreciate that. That's the perfect answer. My next question is, are we also taking into account deployment? I, I hate to just say we're giving raises because the market allows it and that's it. If we have an employee who's not performing well, who's a position of not that being taken into account as well, or is it just strictly the market data reflects it, therefore we will continue? Um, it, is, it is both, technically. Um, this is primarily looking at market ranges and getting the position in the right range. Um, this third 
this third column right there, that's the actual wage dollar amount that somebody would make. So if you look at those top 10 or so lines, on a 12-month basis, we're actually increasing several of those only $150. And so for some of these, it's really not a pay increase. It's just putting them in the right range so they have more opportunity to make more if they stay longer. Um, there are that one with the engineer. That is a position I'm concerned we're going to lose him at any time. And so this is getting them in the right range. It will increase their wage significantly. In the police, we are looking at increases in some of those hourly pay amounts in order to help keep them here. And so performance is factored in in our January performance revaluations. But for purposes of this, um, there's nobody on this chart that I would consider not eligible as far as performance. department head, not only do we want to be, have a, an amazing culture and, 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 you know, a three or four and all that and talent development within the departments, but we also want to be a city that we're not fighting for scraping the bottom of the barrel and just hiring rookies. Police department, you have massive liability. You don't want to be on the front page of the paper because someone reacted. We want seasoned individuals. One, when he's looking to hire someone, he's getting, we're, we're taking, we're trying to get a little bit more of the cream of the crop of the applicants yeah. to be attracted here is, is what I've heard from some of our department heads as well. Yeah, and uh, to, to uh, add to that, it's not that they're, they're just uh, water operators. They, they are raking asphalt. They are cleaning sewers. They, they wide skill set. Wide skill set, and that's uh, if you go to a bigger city, he says, All I do is TV truck, yeah. and nothing more. And, and with, with us, we have to have a, a very qualified person that we can put in, in multiple, like he can jump in a back on a dump truck, on a truck, and, and you know that it, it works in the business. I guess overall, I would say uh, let's, let's not take a closed minded approach. Just because the market says so doesn't mean we should give someone a raise. And just because the market says so doesn't mean we shouldn't give someone a bigger raise for the right people on the bus. Mm -hmm. Let's just make sure we're keeping the right people and paying people for the right reasons. Just because the market says we can't pay someone higher, but it's the right person like we've talked about today, let us know. Let's, let's make sure that the right people are staying, and let's make sure we're not giving the wrong people raises just because. So, so that you're, again, I, I think we've mentioned this, but within our current policies, so we as, as the administrator and department heads, we can move somebody within their range. And so that's what we're trying to get right by this, is the range. And so the, the beginning to ending. And, but we can't move somebody out of that range to a higher range. And so that's where if we're seeing everybody saying, hey, I can top out at $45 an hour at seven other agencies, and you guys top out at 38 we can't change that without coming to you guys for approval. And so, so we can move somebody up the range to try to keep the right people. Right. Um, this is just trying to stop the bleeding a little bit. So, um, and, and at least get those, those ranges in the right spot where it's, and again, we're not leading the pack in, in any of these. Um, the, the, with those police numbers, those percentages on the proposed midpoint, uh, we would still be looking at 35 to 40 percent of our comparables that pay better in their range. Yeah, I think it's 
administration and school and do to get my kids to sit for a second and value them and that they're always looking to make sure that they're not the best or even just being considered as the one that's competitive so we can keep them. Yeah. Uh, good morale builder for the employees. And we heard a lot of comments with the 6% about that. Thank you. It, it made a big difference across the board. I've heard yeah, I think to Jake's point, you know, being fiduciaries for the citizens, that's, that's a big concern. You know, as we increase wages and staffing, these are ongoing, compounding, multi-million dollar liabilities. So we do want to proceed using a lot of data and doing so in a reasonable fashion and just kind of answering to both ends of that balance. Um, so I, and I appreciate that Adams, you know, kind of put it out on the table with employees the next day. You might notice there was an email that, hey, there may not be a full, this may be your COLA for this, you know, so he kind of set the stage for that expectation, but we gave you this bump a little bit ahead because of how the market has been so crazy. That, you know, got a lot of, uh, a great morale boost and kept some people who were shopping or being recruited, potentially coached hopefully to stay here, that are really fantastic people, and then hopefully what we're doing now is looking at the positions that are still a little out of alignment and creating that range so people can see, okay, I have potential to progress in my pay range duties to, to have a career here that I'm not going to be paid six years from now, you know, less than if I go to Orange. And uh, we'll still have the merit portion and maybe that's something we discuss more in depth is uh, the merit portion, how that is distributed or how that works and what that looks like. So is that fair yeah, that, summary? The, the, yes, thank you. Um, any other any other questions or thoughts on this? I, I just appreciate the comments. It's so important for me to have the right people and every department here wants the right people. In fact I just made a note that uh, Las Vegas Metro is coming Uh, Tempe, Arizona is coming to UVU to try and take the right people. So that's important to, I think, all of us is the right moral understanding. I'd just like to say to the um, comments here that we are so blessed in Linden to be in the municipality where we're looking so fine at the, the fine tooth comb of what we have to do here. But we're also so blessed at the fact that outside our, um, our summertime pool staff, I can say that I know by name of the majority of our staff members and that we can say, I can look somebody in the eye and say, mm, I, you're doing a great job or, mm, you know, maybe we just don't have a lot of people, you know, leaning on sho uh, shovels, as they say, or a lot of government jobs as the, you know, the old um, adage of, you know, our, of the lazy government. Well, that we don't have that in Linden. We have the ability to be able to, if we need to nudge or to cultivate a better work environment, we don't have those kind of employees here and we're blessed to have that. So I just want to say I'm grateful for the opportunity to have to know most of our employees um, on a first name basis um, if we take that opportunity, but at the same time to ask the, the, the residents and citizens, taxpayers, that we are doing our due diligence to, to um, hold things at a proper level. So that's my thoughts. Feelings about this coming forward in March for a discussion and action item? Okay. So, yeah, if that's okay. And, and what, what I'm going to present in that meeting, I, I, part of what I, I don't, technically this is all public record, and if, if people wanted to dig into it, they could find it, but I'm, I do not want to show the differences and in increases between some of those because we didn't put all of them on the same range and so and not on the same that. step. There were some conscious decisions when we met with department heads to say, hey, here's what the data shows. Let's keep them here, but somebody else needs to be here. And so, okay. Um, it was 377000 on that 6% for a, a full year. And so this will be adding to that. Um, again, a huge, you know, huge bump. Um, we understand that, and something that I mean, that's a million every three years. Right, and so we stop the bleeding, and then we'll just yeah. be on an even keel, and then just yep. have to do moderate increases. That's about it. So thank you. We'll uh, discuss it in March. And T 
typically we would not do it that fast, but again, we're, we're losing people. And even with this recent increase, and so we wanted to bring this forward sooner. And the federal government, as of uh, for this year, had um, put their COLA rate for the Social yeah. Security index at 5.9, mm -hmm. and they had not done that in probably 15 years. And for many years, it was a zero percent COLA increase. And so I think we were really in line with what the federal government was doing for the basics of Social Security index. So. Thanks. Um, sorry, one more thing on that before we leave that. Just an FYI, we are also looking at mayor and council compensation. Interestingly, we thought we had good data and PG put on their agenda just last week to increase their compensation for mayor and council. Um, and so we, it, yeah, it, it got us, <laughs> it got us a little bit hesitant that well, we their city's it. making changes so rapidly yeah. right now. And so yes. Chase and I will, will work on that and gather some more current data and bring that forward if we feel like that's uh, an issue that doesn't meet these same similar criteria. So. Um, just an FYI, health insurance rates. Um, we met last week with our consultants that if they put this out to the market every year and help us go through all the hoops that are involved with that um, to stay with our current provider, PEHP, um, they're anticipating a 6.8% increase. Uh, we look at a 5 to 7% increase as typical every year. Um, we've, we've tended to stay within that range. If it, if it caps over that 7-ish percent, uh, then we've bid that out. What we've found when we bid it out and go to the low provider is the second year, they jack our rates up. And so uh, we're, we're looking that, we, I think we're on our, this will be if we stay with PEHP, this is our fourth year. And so very likely we'll bid this out again next year, but our, our intent right now is probably to stay with PEHP given this 6.8%, which is kind of within that range we, we would expect. Um, okay, any comments or questions on personnel issues? Okay, we're moving on, we're getting there. Um, Public Works, capital improvement projects. So uh, road projects, uh, we spent uh, 1.97 million on uh, 221. Um, 1.85 coming on this uh, year's, but uh, next year's, is that correct, Adam? And the road phone balance is uh, 3 million. So we're trying to, to stay within the 2 million, 1.7 million uh, projects. Some for next year, I think we're only asking for 1.25, just so we can save all the, push push the other balance for uh, the following year, because we have uh, Center Street coming with the temple, and then we also have uh, Canal Drive, and a few other projects that we're gonna be adding. So we included in, in your staff report packet that we emailed out, uh, Juan and Trent and Noah have put together a five-year road improvement plan. And so um, it has some estimated dollar amounts for the next five years and then identifies the different surface treatments and where those will go. Um, anything else you want to add to that? I love this. This is very helpful. Mm -hmm. And just kind of for me verbally, I'm going to work real hard to refine those each year. That is our goal. This or more. In fact, the mayor brought up there was a few other streets that maybe um, we have a healthy enough fund balance that we want to be able to provide you opportunity to, if, if we have a squeaky wheel that we need to oil, uh, even if it doesn't meet our best roads first type of scenarios, um, we have some flexibility to add some funding in there. So we'll, we'll look at those as, as we may hear some concerns or complaints. We're also working on uh, some uh, software to be able to plan better and faster results. So if you say, you know what, instead of doing 1.5, do 1.7, we're able to bring some of the roads that were for next year and bring them into the next year based on, because right now it's it's all on a spreadsheet and we have to do quite quite the calculation to get the results you want, so. Juan, yes. water retention and the ponds and so forth. You know, obviously conservation is the most cost effective, but you also mentioned the possibility of enlarging those. So if we do not do uh, any changes, um, behavioral changes on saving water, 
then if we're trying to keep the same level of service, then, then we will have to build bigger reservoirs and enlarge pipes on the roads to be able to keep the level of service. Mm -hmm. You have places to do that in the future? No. no not that, that we own. We don't have to go out there and get more property. Okay. Thank you. Question, what year do you plan on doing the Center Street? Center Street, it's a multi-phase. We have, uh, now that the, the temple is going to really get, uh, get in gear, we have the first year we're replacing some of the underground infrastructure. Second year would be getting all the curb and gutter and sidewalk installed, kind of shape the road, and then just before the, well, the same year the temple opens, then we will resurface the entire road so so we don't have all the construction, construction yeah. traffic uh, beating up the... So sh shoulder and widening improvements wouldn't be until probably summer or fall of 2023. Correct. So we've got some time still to work through that. At what point do we discuss some of the safety issues we need to support the public schools and, and bus traffic and pedestrian traffic through that area, whether it's workshops or is that going to be in this budget as well or is that in the... On a That's in the, in the future budget for the curb gutter and sidewalk, but we are already evaluating okay. where we want to do some of the crosswalks if, if we're going to end up... Uh, what, what you guys had talked about to us in our engineering meeting was kind of bringing you a buffet of choices that you could look at and potential costs. And so we, we plan to do that in the next few months. And I wanted to ask the council also um, on that. So I have reached out. So the school district, um, just so you know, they um, I had gotten in touch with the, um, Rob Smith, the head superintendent. Um, a lot of the residents out on the west side had indicated um, they really wanted a neighborhood elementary school out there and with the population growth that's happening, not only with us, but PG, potentially they're um, commuting over to Aspen or Linden Elementary. Um, the school district just acquired the property that we kind of pointed out to them what would, that would be ideal. And they closed on that um, a week and a half ago. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're... It's that property right in the middle of Anderson Farms that Ivory Homes was hoping to get. Thorn. Yeah, Thornton. Thorn. 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 The Thorn yeah. property. What is that about? Uh, right there. So they just closed on it, and that's going to be a holding spot for an elementary school. And so talking with the school district, what, what we're hoping to do is sit down with their staff and our staff and discuss Center Street because of you know some of the interests they're going to have with the schools that they service and there and hopefully understand also what their intentions are with Linden Elementary, which is, um, he indicated to me, yes, it's an aging school. And um, the last I chatted with some board members, um, they're going to be evaluating um, Linden Elementary, what their plans are and timelines and things. That's going to be a discussion meeting that they'll be addressing to me. Um, they have a lo had a lot of shrinking population in some areas of the district and so sometimes looking at how they utilize and shift boundaries for different schools so they keep um, the number of students in those schools you know balanced and they have the right number so that's something we're going to be looking at between us and kind of North Arrow um, and then I wanted to ask the council something that's come to me from a couple of planning commissioners and people in the community as well is with Center Street, you know, this is a, a main uh, kind of marquee street for our community. It goes by our, our city center. It's going to be, you know, it's just where many of our school children come. So certainly safety issues are really going to be an important issue. Uh, but also what do we want to do as far as beautification? Do we want to create, you know, we have sidewalk curb and gutter um, in the budget, but uh, some have suggested do we you know, maybe we have a, a committee. There's a lot of uh, residents along Center Street that are very keenly interested in what's going to happen along Center Street. Some of them have, you know, they would love to see it beautified or some elements brought in, whether that's we, want, we have a tree plan and it's tree-lined or uh, maybe there's certain fixtures or light posts or, you know, certain um, bulb outs or landscaping, what that might look at like. So uh, I just wanted to kind of put that out there to council. Is that something potentially we want to do is get some community engagement, maybe have an official beautification committee or just kind of work 
with, you know, maybe do some open houses or we have a couple of years to sort of plan this out. Juan, I see you have something to mention. Yeah, so, so what, what I'm gonna bring to you is just the, the bare bones to get a uh, curb gutter sidewalk curb streets gutter done. And then based on, on that amount, perhaps you can guide us to say, you know what, we have this much money, what, what can we do with it? And maybe perhaps we can, we can go about it that way. Can I make a Thank suggestion you. with living in that area? A lot of people have reached out to me, lots. What did I say, lots? A lot of people, people reach out to me. Yeah. And uh, I've been on both wards on 400 East. Anyway, no, most of the people, probably 80% of the people are in my next shed. And they are reaching out to me and wanting to be involved in some way. So uh, some sort of an open house where maybe they get a chance to put their little stickers on what they'd like to have and have a voice. I, I like some of who've done with the parks and those kind of situation would be, I think, very helpful to have them feel like they have a voice and get some um, information firsthand from us would be really helpful. I like your idea of this is the bare bones and maybe give them a little wish list or, or uh, opportunity to weigh in on this, especially as we come to the point of the groundbreaking. This is gonna pique their interest and I'd rather them come get their questions answered there than perhaps coming to us in a public open house. That would be good because in my office it's all straight lines yes. are beautiful to us, so. <laughs> but I know, but we, right? want, we want the input and the trouble with what I thought Noah thought was great. Yeah. <laughs> so. really yes. a big tree you got figured in there. Yes. That's right, you have to make a little. So, so we're not looking for answers now, just putting that out there, we can make it a public discussion in the city council meeting, what, you know, what sort of community engagement we want to maybe strategize on. Okay. There's also a group of individuals that live on Nine Hundred East that would like to beautify the canal pathway that along with. Good luck with the county. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Mayor Acherson. We, we actually have a meeting yeah. with the church project manager next week, and they'll be talking about some things. They're just talking on their side of the asphalt, mm -hmm. and so are are the neighbors looking for more than that? Yeah. Okay, so I think that will be done as part of the temple project. What so Mayor Isherson shared with, with Adam and I was that, you know, he's been negotiating that on the city's behalf, but that they would, like Adam's saying, to kind of put in maybe some wise water landscaping, you know, on the, the shoulder that's just touching them, and uh, then turn over the maintenance to the city. And so I don't know if that would be part of the conversation. Well, what about the other shoulder? Or so, those are questions. We'll see, we we'll see what they're proposing. There's some individuals that are willing to donate. I understand. And so they, they have some yeah. things identified in that yeah. frame of mind. So. Continue with the public works. Yeah, let's fly through. Yeah, some of this. so we're continuing to evaluate utilities <coughs> underneath the roads before we build the road. We want to make sure we have good, reliable utilities. Uh, we're looking at uh, some property acquisition on Lakeview Drive, uh, the Gary Thornton or the Cook property, to uh, build one uh, the street. Can you just step oh, to the side? So there we go. Just leave him on that. Oh, you're good. Thanks. So Thornton seems like it at all. I know he's. Gary Thornton? Down April 10th or whatever. Gary? Yeah. Oh, he's, so he's gonna sell that property to that developer? So he's, he's a, he has an agent that, um, I'm telling you that he's quitting. Right. He's stuffing his business. I'm not telling you he's selling it. I see, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> Gary Thornton. Oh yeah, he's hired an agent to try to sell that property and put it. So we have a, a connecting street that is supposed to be there in the master plan from 400 north to 400 west. So that property kind of gets dissected there in half, and then we're looking at that uh, northwest property to put a uh, detention basin to help with our uh, stormwater uh, flows and possible a future well. So it'll be a, it's not big enough for a park, but we can probably do it, some kind of a, green open open space. Yeah, one and a half to two acre kind of size open space. So. Correct. So, uh, we're trying, I'm talking with Adam, see what the, the negotiations with Gary, Gary Thornton are and see where we would get financing to get that property. And, and Juan, just also the, um, 
attaching to Gilman Lane as Correct. well. Yes. You mentioned that, and I think that's important to note because a lot of residents have been upset about the uh, wild oak, you know, coming up the state street. This way it would allow those patrons to come to a light signal. Yes, yeah, so off that, uh, if you can picture a curve going from 400 west to 400 north, and then a little street going north towards uh, towards Gilman Lane. So that 400 north continues back to the city of Pittsburgh? Yes, yeah. it will continue. Um, that happens. You actually own the ground the right there underneath that the old, the old church. church. Yeah. 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 That was supposed to happen a year ago, wasn't it? We, we bought the ground, but it never, yeah, we have to give them a year notice, and then we're on the hook to build that, so... Um, Anyway, that's just a heads up. This is on the horizon, and does that, we'll, we'll keep working on it. Does that property fit our overlay? Um, Mike Marchbanks and I had some neighbors with pitchforks and torches on our doorstep saying that that was going to be townhomes like the Lane Nursery and like the Elwood. Even, you know, even before the more recent changes, it would probably be eligible for some of those like, what is it, up to four or six units, similar to kind of what was done over by Mazer Academy on Lake West. Mm -hmm. Something like that, it would be eligible regardless of this other one, but you're yeah. not going to get 60 units. Right. So does that, yeah. does so that it, answer it some of that? one of those circles that it could have a... Um, I don't know the answer to that offhand. I mean, if the city if the city picks up the west side of where those roads would bisect everything, the the two pieces that are remnants are only like an acre, and so. And didn't the church have interest on? The church had interest in acquiring the piece all the way to the. They were hopeful to pick up the piece right behind their new building, and and so. The Bible church. Yeah, I don't know whether or not that not would actually church. happen. But. The Bible church. <laughs> Small team. Yeah. The church Small right there. The Small team. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I know the 8th and 7th Gary have a lot of interest in developers, and so we probably need to mm -hmm. take that signal away there. Yeah. That road does cut to a, a damper of what you can do with the property. With the way that we want to do this particular road route. And that was kind of my point. With the road plan and the We can get all of the things we need there. I'm hoping we can pursue that. Okay, we'll we'll talk more about that as we get closer. So yeah, we'll be revisiting that overlay. Next step. Okay. Um, we already covered point number five, uh, talking about Center Street and the uh, the road reconstruction on the cemetery. We are looking at. Uh, looking at the expansion of the future burial land and uh, also cons building a, uh, a shop with uh, two, two bathrooms and a small office. We're looking at uh, about 200 plus thousand. We have uh, Jim, no, what's uh, Mayor Dane, Jim Dane, doing our, our uh, architectural design. And then we have the secondary water metering. I don't know if you want to go into that right now or... Yeah, we know this is a big topic. Um, I've sent you guys some recent updates. This looks very... Yes, that's one word for it. So it's... Um, but very likely that this is going to pass the Senate. Um, that article today that I sent, the link from the, the Tribune that the league forwarded out, one of those water managers, I think he said it will be a horrific implementation um, and so we, we understand that we know that's how everybody's gonna feel on this um, but I think we're getting boxed into a corner pretty quickly so um, we'll talk more about this this isn't a decision thing tonight um, our expectation is this is likely to pass the Senate as soon as that does we'll schedule another discussion item with you guys um, the state agency that is managing this, they're reeling a little bit because now every water entity in the state is going to be going after for these, these monies. Um, they don't even have our draft agreement finished yet. I talked to them just yesterday. And so um, this is a new program when we applied uh, several months ago. 
Um, one interesting tidbit that may be beneficial out of all of this for us is right now, with the way the new legislation is written, there's opportunity to be funded up to 70% with state grants. When we applied last year, it was only 50%. So I threw out the question to them of, hey, can we submit a new application or amend our application and increase the amount that, that could be eligible for a grant? And they s it sounded like that was an option. But again, I don't think they know what they're doing yet. And so um, the administration part of this is, is gonna be a lift for the agency. So um, we do feel some urgency because once this is enacted, every entity that provides secondary water has to comply, meaning everybody's out trying to buy meters in the next few years, everybody applying for the grants in the next few years, the money that's available from the state decreases every year that you wait to apply for a grant, so everybody's gonna be motivated in these next two fiscal years to put these in. So, so being ahead of the game, at least financially, is a good thing for us where we can hopefully put our order in and maybe you know, get meters for six months. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, talking with the suppliers, they are willing to respect the price that they quoted me back when I got the rebate, so. Can I express that for me and I think others that this is, it's a very multi-pronged scenario, especially for me. And so we, we're dealing with all the mandates that are coming down, but I also like would like to see us as a city um, articulate how to handle those part or the legacy people from 93. That how, we, how are we gonna explain this to them? And I like the, um, the thoughts of, I think it was Dan that was talking about, how do we then say, this is what you paid, if you'd have maintained it, this is what it would have been, and so that we have some sort of a scenario in which to discuss this rationally with them, some, some bullet points that are specific with data or is, that's historic, to give them some perspective that, no, you didn't just turn on your water and now you're not getting, you now you're going to be charged. So whatever our scenario is that we choose, that we also have the information that we have to deal with these individuals that I think need to be respected in that sense. So we need to have a high level of, of, of being able to engage with them and articulate in a way that um, will not escalate this problem and have it become some sort of a hornet's nest that we really want to you know, not have happen because just because the state's doing it doesn't mean we don't, you know, yes, we all need to be good water-wise citizens, but we need to then articulate what's happening. So I think I, I see several heads nodding on this. And so for us to be able to yeah, do this, I think is just as paramount as to how we, how we reconcile ourselves ourself, ourself with the state and what they're asking us to do. I think these are two heavily um, important topics for us, independent and drilled together. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Well, I, I sent out that initial uh, mm -hmm. draft outreach, and we'll, we'll just be building upon that to, to address a lot of those and historic... And make sure it's like right. a tract. Right. You know, something that you're going to go out and tract with. <laughs> right. For all those who have done tracting. <laughs> Not me, but I need to have some bullet points for that. How detailed is, are our records on those who are legacy and how many shares they came in? We found a shoe box uh, mm -hmm. uh, three months yeah, ago. A cigar box, I think. Mary, so. Mary has a lot of good information. Yeah. She has spent the last four months putting a lot of information on that. Because as we move so. forward, we have to consider equal protection clause. We have to treat people equally. But if we can identify this class who have provided something, they are their own class, and we can maybe come up with different rules that, you know, for, for the legacy folks. But we're going to have to make sure that we have some good records. So I'll, I'll reach out with you once, and I'll talk to you out in about that. And so, those, oh, yeah, go ahead. those of us that attend to the Central Utah Water District day training, too, there was some great information. I think when we have this public discussion, we can circle that and get everybody else on the council up to speed on some of the things we learned. And Saratoga Springs Mayor Jared Miller spoke, and he, they had some excellent ways that they kind of went after this and implemented it already, some best practices, tips on do's and don'ts. And so he was amazing. So, so ba based on that yeah. conference, uh, yeah. everybody's bombarding uh, Saratoga Springs for information. So now they're actually gonna come out with a big packet so they can just, yeah. here's to the city, here's to that city, so. So that's great. And can we have some sort of a inventory, some sort of, so we know who they are, identify their names and addresses um, so that we can, as um, council, be able to be, make yeah. it's it's water's personal. 
and we need to be personal with these people, in my opinion. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll compile a PR campaign and get a lot of this data and have multiple more discussions. This would be a good thing for, in my opinion, to have an open house on once once we get all of our ducks in a row. Yeah, I think we need um, to discuss it and decide strategy and you know how we want to shape certain situations. You know, like you know, what would one be? You know, a certain acreage <coughs> has a certain threshold of usage before you know. Do we treat different acreages differently, or we need to flesh all that out? So on those. And I definitely think we need to be heard. I mean, yeah. that's what uh, we, what we saw at rest that one night is they weren't being heard and they didn't know enough. And and what we saw is it's just the tip of the iceberg. There was a lot more underneath that. Yeah. Something to keep in mind, I'm just I'm throwing out a word of caution. People are bringing up comments that council members made 35 years ago. So don't commit anything, please. <laughs> really, don't say, I'm not going to raise your rates. Because you don't know that that's not going to happen in 20 or 30 years. You're trying to bound, bind a future city council's actions. So just throwing out that caution. Um, the other thing is, as we're talking about fees on this in the future, we are collecting revenues off of base rates and base rates being the monthly 10 or $12 a month fee. And we're collecting revenues off of all of Anderson Farms who is putting in secondary meters and they're being charged a usage rate right now. So those are revenues that we would have to make up somewhere. So I, I want you to be careful and not think in your mind, we're gonna put this in and not charge anything. That's incorrect because we would lose out on millions of dollars of revenue that we have to make up somewhere else. Does that make sense? So we're collecting money right now, so don't, don't think in your mind we're gonna put in a secondary meter and not charge anybody. We may put in a secondary meter and not charge a usage rate, but there's still gonna be uh, that base rate that we have to collect to cover our current operations and maintenance needs. Does that make sense? I'm just throwing that out there. I know that's that's a wish list item. Can we just put this in and not charge anybody? The only thing I want to commit to is that we're going to get educated about this. Yes. And I think that's the most important. Educate ourselves, educate the public. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I no think personal. we're all on the same page. Of what, what I'm hearing from Randy and from everyone is let's, let's come with something organized with the data so that we can hopefully head off the rumor mill where people are going to have a very emotional reaction. This so. is going to have to happen quickly. Yeah. We're yeah. going to have to act it's quickly. Going, yeah. House Bill 242, how it's written, you cannot not do this as quickly as possible. Yeah. There's just, Yesterday is too late. whether you like it or not, the way it is written with the penalties, the lack of money going down, you have to do this and you have to do it quickly. I'm just sorry, I sidetrack a little bit. I'm curious, did Representative Peterson, who is in our area, contact any of you as elected officials about this bill? Mm -mm. He's, no, he is the sponsor, the house sponsor. Email. Just interesting. So. Okay. Um, what's that? Okay, thanks very much. Let's jump to community development, general plan stuff. Yeah, uh, before I get to that, I just wanted to. They are oh, asking. Man. They are asking for are incentive. Are they coming with an ask specifically yet? Thank you. 
So those are things that we'll we'll pull the trigger on here soon in the next month or so. I just want to give you a heads up. It's a little bit more than we had budgeted, but we'll carry that additional forward. So any thoughts, concerns on those? Okay. Uh, joint planning commission meeting. You want to bring that date up too? Yeah. Uh, one and two of February twenty second. Um, March. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> yeah. March twenty second. You're going to give them an oh, overview of these two overview of projects. These two projects. Uh, we might be it might have Mag come and give yeah. a presentation on some updates to the businesses on uh, roadways and bridge housing. Six o'clock. be brief. I'd like to really start doing these maybe on a more regular basis, getting our two bodies together and just having some more collaboration, kind of getting the same visioning ideas together, but of course they will always be their independent body, recommending body, but not to get them to be a me too body, but just some of them have expressed uh, just wanting to kind of know what it is that kind of long-range vision so that we can sort of be on the same page as far as what they're sending up the yeah, pipeline to us. More. You're still going to check with them if any of them have a conflict. Did you already? Okay, so that there go. At okay. least the five that were there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Parks and Rec, Keith, you want to run through? Yeah, I just have noticed that on the first two, the last two pages of your, your packet are the two pages that go along with this. Um, in order to, to offset some of the cost, we've been really trying to squeeze the pool budget. Uh, working with Adam and Kristen, but we, we think it might be time to maybe raise the pool rate prices. Uh, everything else is going up, including wages for people and the difficulty of it. So this page, it looks really busy. Maybe I can just explain it. Um, yeah, it's the last it's in the page. email the staff report we sent out. Yeah, it's the second. It's the second. This was the second to last page. You put a proposed the current fee, the proposed fee, and then the increase. Uh, what we're or what what it would be um, is that the difference column? Yeah, the increase. The, yeah, the, the increase would be the a dollar. Like for example, the first one three and under is free right now. We propose they be charged a dollar, but we increase it a dollar. Do you have? This was my question coming in. Is if we do this, it brings in X based on last year's numbers. I'll show you. Okay. Uh, really quick. Uh, so you can look down here. Three and under have been free. We thought maybe a dollar. Um, and then you can just see where, where instead of $4.50, maybe $5. So 50 cent increases, dollar increase uh, on super seniors. Um, Monday night for, for a family would be increased up $2.50. Uh, these are all the other passive in increases. If you want to look down these, you can, you can see. So here's what you were talking about, Van. In April, you can see how many pen punch passes we sold on Wix, which is our website, uh, 32, um, that the price 32 total the proposed would be 36 for those passes. So we would make just in April, according to last year's data, five, uh, 2370 on all those pass increases. But if you, if you scroll down, Adam, you'll be able to see in May, 
4,099, but throughout the rest of the summer, the revenue increase would be 48,000, according to last year's numbers on 50 cents in the dollar increases. Um, except for Pleasant Grove Pool, between 450 and 750 is the pool rates for most people. So we're, act, we're looking at $6 for non-residents, $5 for, for residents, and so that's a 50 cent increase. We are, we are looking to, to try to increase the revenue, and I wanted to just have an opinion on that. Uh, if we could bring that as, as a March, be, be done in March, if we want to raise the fees. On the side note, we did raise the fees for the parties $100, and, and that's the second page uh, that you'll see here. Um, the second page, oh no, it's not actually on that. It's just the, the, the ones that we've got. I've got four nights left. Uh, that extra hundred dollars, we should have tripled it. <laughs> it did. Nobody even bought that. Uh, the dentists, insurance groups, lawyers, and they're still putting in, you know, two thousand dollar caterers. You know, to come in. So that might be a consideration later too, because now if you look at the second page, the party revenue at the very bottom. Adam, can you go to that last page? Um, these are the current, well, that's the season ending discussion. Let's go down to the bottom. Our, our take on parties is really not as good as, as we'd like. Um, the average guard, this is just for lifeguards for parties, okay, is about $12.19 right now. They're four hours. I need 22 guards, so every night we're spending $1,000.72 on a possible $1,800 party. The take is $7.27. So we're not you know, doubling our money in those parties, uh, which brought up the second thought. In a cost savings measure, do we want to consider at school start shutting down the pool? There's four days, generally speaking, per pool. A Saturday, a Saturday, then, well, this year will be a Saturday, a Saturday, then Memorial Day Monday. Three open pool days. But parties, all those listed there, are parties above, are the parties that have already booked with us. And if we do it this year, we'll have to cancel them because they're after school starts. Okay, so we would lose some revenue there. But what I'm doing is I'm keeping the pool treated and heated and chemicaled and all those things, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for a Friday or a Saturday day open and, and parties. And so we, we figure if we shut it down and stop doing chemicals at school start, uh, it, it could be a cost savings for us overall. We could cut the staff loose. So the $18,000, $19,000 of those parties that we would get, um, we'd have an overhead savings in the long run. Even though we would lose that 18, that 19, almost $19,000 in revenue. So two questions. Are you, are you willing to entertain raising the pool rate? And secondly, in a cost savings effort to try to keep some of this under control, do you want to consider maybe shutting the pool down on, well, this year would be because it's the middle of August, you know, that last Saturday before school starts on that Monday or Tuesday. So it's, I think, the 13th would be our last day. I think, I think the Goodwill, losing the Goodwill of a lot of things, but the, not just those entities, it's all the people that work. Yeah, and Adam and I have talked about those people. Yeah. But, you know, We've got the problem the rest of the world has got, too, because keeping those parties open for people with guards who all go back to school that first day mm -hmm. is also, if we had a six-guard rotation, we could do that. But with 20, 21 guards on duty for that four hours, it's a little tougher when, when school starts. So I don't want to hurt those people who have booked this year either. But, if but you're concerned life, about having enough. But life. I'm concerned about not having enough lifeguards, and and uh, pool savings and operations. Well, for the first question, absolutely <coughs> raise the rates. Okay. Everybody feel the same way about that? Okay. We'll, we'll we'll get that taken care of. We got the numbers and everything we need. And, and maybe you look at I don't know what you do this year, but in the future that if you're gonna to try to do a party, school closes August, or starts August 15th, the August 16th builds up an extra thousand or something, just what, whatever you have to do to get the guards there. 
if, if any the guards more is what yes. you're saying, slide the guard scale. Yeah, just in the opinion. Oh, this is for slide scale. Only, and the party and the party on these dates, only on those dates. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only, yeah, only on the because they'll yeah. they'll and still sell, but remember our take is seven hundred and twenty seven dollars, it's not too shabby. That's not right. something to slot that more. But if one thought is is there a way to do a a bidding process where you have these companies, there's probably dozens that would like to have the tool as well. There's Currently that's in the fee schedule now, that, that I can take premium dates that people all want and put it up for bid, who wants it the most. We haven't because it's, so far we've been pretty good, but now we're getting full every year. So we, we still have that option. After school starts, uh, if we slide the scale with $1,800, well, our take will be less because it'll be goodwill. But this is only lifeguards. It's not a cashier, a manager, and at least one cashier, a manager, and uh, and uh, custodian, janitor to help. So it even goes down from so maybe five hundred dollars is what we take. My recommendation is is not maybe to do this this year, but maybe really consider it throughout the year and either make them premium dates at the end of the year and maybe slide the scale because partially the other half is guarding it has been tough to do too as soon as school starts we're we're really scraping the boat with the bottom of the barrel i know that orem stayed open until october the late october their outdoor pool last year uh, the water heat you know good days are good days bad days are bad days their, their rec center was closed too so um, just, just to move this along then general theme is make it work however we can. Is that what I'm kind of hearing? Yeah, so maybe through ga gathering data, what does it take to keep the guards there and so you kind of know a, what the bonus system might be, what, what, but yeah. assigns kind of a dollar value. In the past, um, the department gave the guards that stayed through the end of the season just kind of got a one-time... 25 cent per... Bonus. Yeah, per day. Um, and per some of work. them this really were looking the, forward to that. Bucks. And they weren't getting it the last year or two, so they're like, well, we're not going to get the bonus, so I'm just going to quit when school starts anyway. Would you treat those dates as if they were holiday kind of pay? But, you know, I yeah, we, we can do that, but again, what we're trying to do is we'll cut. We'll lose money not, on that. Yeah, what we're trying to well, do is consider cut. If you want to support. If we do that, that means if we're creating some sort of incentive pay for the, then I believe that my opinion is absolutely it's got to be a pass on cost to those who book that date. So. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And uh, a couple other things: the Geneva Park Master Plan design. I have somebody this year. Uh, I've got some some feelers out, and I'm going to get some bids about it. About uh, just the design, sketch design, not high level. Do we have any interest in any fish in this property? So this one, this is on our master plan. Um, Jeff called me a couple weeks ago and just said, is the city still interested in that four acres up there? And I said, well, it was adopted. It's on our parks master plan. And he says, well, you just pull the council and he's got people asking to develop down there. Um, and now that he's not under the umbrella of the city, what's that? Some people are used to that. Is it? And so he's got some offers that sound enticing and um, he wants to make sure those buyers know that this is of strong interest to the city. Financially, I don't know if it's zero to 10 million. I have no clue where we're at. Um, and as far as the cost of the park or what? To obtain the property and whether or not, uh, I haven't had a conversation. Is that a, is that We've a purchase talked about, or is yeah. it a donation? Mm -hmm. I have no clue. I always assumed it was a donation from the city and county to the county. Yeah, I, I don't want to commit him to anything that makes no sense. And if we were not to adjacent land that um, he owns, he and Karen own, is that, would that be underserved by not having a park in there if that becomes developed now that he's in that position to choose to do that? <coughs> it's an, that's an interesting question because this is not a very programmable park because it's on a slope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one, of, one of the things we've talked about, I think in past conversations is, you know, you have your sod and grass and sports field parks and then sometimes you'll see in some communities they'll have parks that are more of a natural setting with some you know amenities put in that fit that topography or maybe a different type of recreational opportunity 
than what your other it cards did. High, highly recommended yeah. on our master plan. Everyone yeah. has one pulled. Yep. I didn't yeah, want something whether it's a na nature hike or spot. right now the kids. I, when I lived there for 15 years, the kids use this. This is like a. There's lots of cool oak, you know, oak trees and brush, and they they off road. Mo they bicycled with their dirt bikes or motorized and unmotorized. They build forts. Yeah. They have. It's, it's like a, a really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I would imagine it would be. This would be a wonderful place to kind of keep somewhat of a natural setting, mm -hmm. and you know, maybe it's where there's a pump track or some of these things. That, yeah. Well, one of the cedar porches at the top mm -hmm. has that. Yeah, yeah, it's in this corner right there. If you're curious. That, that's where we have it master planned. So I, we don't have to make a decision on this tonight, clearly. But I think he was just wanting to see, he knows it's on the master plan. Is there interest to explore it further with the council? That's really. And I think yes. Okay. And, and I think part of that question, too, is did Jeff and Karen have a vision for Right. Is there something kind of, I've always had this in the back of my mind that I would like to see happen here. And we'd be open to whatever parcel that they would want to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's that was more like a. Oh, he's. I think he's got his phone. Or I know we passed. Her. I just thought I wanted to get all the council and staff up to speed really quickly um, with what Heath was mentioning, the Geneva Resort Park Master Plan. So, I met with the mayor of Vineyard, um, and been talking. You know, they're really excited about, um, you might recall that we sold some property to them that now is used by their public works department for a storage uh, equipment facility. And we kept this acreage here that's adjacent to that trail behind the marina. And there's some natural artesian wells. And so sitting down with, with them, their vineyard is really excited because, you know, this is right north of where they have envisioned their, their big city center. And they have a, a multi-billion, multi-million dollar plan for their lakefront. Um, and so the Wakara, you know, Lakeshore Trail and all these things that are sort of being coordinated with Provo and Orem, um, this sort of ties into that. And so one of the things that I sat down with them is, you know, hey, this is something that your residents would be very, would benefit from. For us, it's a little bit stranded out here for our residents. Um, what would be your interest to participate in some fashion vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, funding or towards this or developing it together? And so they're very excited to do that. And uh, so far, the vision that's been discussed and is being explored is, again, not turning it into soccer fields, but um, creating um, the trail there, maybe bringing in the Geneva Resort Pavilion and having some historical markers that speak to the significance of this location um, the, in that, I think we'll probably revisit that master, that uh, the master student who did the, yeah, did the internship thesis, yeah. the thesis. I think we all looked at it years ago, but we're revisiting that and getting a new plan and creating more of like a nature conservancy area, like an education center, talking with Julie and Vineyard, some things that could be really exciting here is utilizing those artesian wells to have some natural ponds and some maybe some pathways and then having some education points, maybe even working with the state to have like boardwalks that can go out into the reeds and the, bre the brushes there in the lakefront and you know, just making something really cool. And so they're excited. She even spoke to the press about it and an article was written up about it. So um, anywhere, hopefully we can, and we have our, uh, we're working on a potential grant application as well, um, collaborating. So we'll we'll see where this goes, and I'm sure Heath will get that studied. And anything else you want to add to that, Heath? No. Okay. I think that's good. And the farmers market. Oh, you farmers know? market. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, if you're familiar, that um, Springville City has a group called uh, Sunset Farmers Market. They also service a couple other communities. They're really great. They, uh, they're no cost to the city. So I've been, uh, Heath and I have been talking with them um, about putting together, having them come this summer through the fall and taking Thursday evenings. All their vendors have said they could come Thursdays and some of their vendors are local growers uh, right here in Linden and uh, they can use our city park. They come, they set it up. It takes no staff time. 
they set it up, they run it, they have food trucks come, they have, their focus is only Utah made items. No one comes as a vendor to resell something made from China or a wholesale item. They have to be actually crafted by that business owner. Um, they have a really cool um, kids entrepreneurship program. So the any kids who have a, a home-based business of some kind and they want to be a vendor, it's free for them. They also have something called the SNAP program where those individuals that are maybe uh, qualified because based on income, they get some food assistance. If they come to the farmer's market and they spend, um, Sunset Farmers will double their purchase for fresh fruit and vegetables. And so it's just a really fun community thing to bring here and it's no cost to the city unless you want to contribute or make a donation to the, the SNAP doubling for those individuals, but they're not requiring that at this point. And I heard you maybe want to add something so to we, that. We've, Brian and Heath have, have worked with this company and, and drafted an agreement that Brian feels ready to go to the council. So we'll bring this forward in March. And we'll ask them to come so you can ask questions. And as ba well. Basically, the, the agreement's necessary because we wouldn't be charging a rental fee down in the park. And so this is setting up some parameters on when they can be here and things like that. So, sorry, Daryl, what was your? Down in the city center of town. Not on Long State Street. <coughs> Quick for you this week. Uh, this, you said it's going to be a little bit smaller than you would have hoped the first couple of years, so it builds. Do you, do you think we're going to have 45, 6 or any? Uh, well, this, yeah, and that would be small. I only get one of those that I've seen. I only go two or three times. Yeah, see, he won't, let, he won't let wholesalers start. He won't let people who are just, who buy and then sell. Like, some, some of our growers here want to buy fruit and then bring to, it and sell it. They're so trying to promote them. locally grown, locally produced, locally crafted businesses. So well, most of them are businesses. We can loop Carlos into that somehow. Mm -hmm. So, okay. And then the last thing on my list is I have two parks and trail amenities. So we'll share with the council in the budget. Uh, we're going to have a master plan that's going to be set this year. It's going to take, you know, it's just uh, nothing to it. We have one playground in here, so we'll see how that ends up. Okay, Chief. Chief. Yeah, just real quickly. Uh, 2023 is when our lease. Manufacturing chips. I did get an estimate from from uh, Ken Garf, and it looks like if we get those those are three thousand dollars, three to four thousand more for our buyback. So it's estimated uh, vehicle cost sixty three thousand five forty three, buyback of forty two thousand. So depreciation. Still evaluate the lease is still applied, but for city our size with lack of maintenance, tires uh, works out well. I think if you go two years, uh, we don't have to replace tires. Essentially, the maintenance costs are pretty low for your vehicles. But I'll evaluate and provide more information to council and the staff. And I'll look for some new purchases. I have a question on that. You yeah. know, you say that the buyback is so low. I know that. Anybody's got a truck. I mean, my husband's truck is from 18. He can go and sell it for what he paid for it brand new. And uh, anybody just wondering about the, how that buyback works uh, and as far as depreciated when it's you can't really depreciate in the actual market versus a lease not being present. Yeah, that's what that's what uh, that's just the way the leases are set up. Sure. You know, it's a guaranteed buyback. So if the market does, yeah, I shouldn't say we don't lose it this time, but we'll probably want several other times. Right. right. That's, right. that's what I was wondering. Well, it's contractually bound where we have to have a certain percentage. What if we incentivize Doug Smith and swap out all the trucks for Kia Souls? Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I'll just say a little gas, but I don't know where you put the cat traps and things. <laughs>
Bicycles, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're evaluating those. Uh, sorry, uh, as I guess, new light bars, several light bars are old. I'm, I'm being told, uh, told by our installers that some of the parts aren't even manufactured anymore, hard to get. So I'm looking to replace those light bars on top of the vehicles. We have uh, 11 vehicles that have light bars out of the fleet, so I'd be looking to change those out. Still doing a little evaluation on that, get another second opinion on it. That's the case on all at once or staggered? All at once during the rotation, so I wouldn't have to. Because uh, when we rotate vehicles out, they go for an installation. Uh, if I go down throughout the month or throughout the year, they take the gears off and put them back in standard. Uh, dash cam, we've been kind of debating that for the year, a little over a year I've been here. We're one of the few cities that do not have dash cams in our vehicles. Uh, to me, it's, it's a big impact. Uh, reliability, accountability, uh, safety, prosecution. Uh, once, once the dash cam comes on, once the light bar comes on, the, the camera comes on. So if somebody's running from us, we see it, we can articulate it, whether we... As far as this comes with 30,000 per year, we're sure to put a camera on it. Storage or it's storage? It's cloud storage, it's evidence storage. Uh, that's, that's where most of the cost comes in, in service. Uh, IT costs for service, and they do a plan, a, a five-year plan where they rotate out equipment for you, everything else. They come and do initial setup and install it, uh, but it is it's it's a hefty price. The difference between the twenty thousand and the thirty thousand, you can go a lower end or you can go a little higher end. A little higher end includes license plate reader technology, which if an officer's driving down the road, an Amber Alert car comes by, a stolen vehicle comes by change it within seconds and we're on, we're on those vehicles. So I'm, I'm evaluating those costs, but they're pretty evident and linked with our current body cameras. So once an officer's out, he just pulls over on a citizen contact, things start to elevate, we can spring the air camera or camera in reverse and bring it to us and we'll start our process of doing the prosecution. And, uh, other things were just minimal, I'll go real quick. This little storage, shed out behind the old fire building right there. That's where we keep bicycles, impound bicycles, lost bicycles. We also keep the Memorial Day flag and we keep some evidence overflow, bigger evidence items in there. The problem I have with that is every officer has access to that to put bikes in, take bikes in, bikes out. I have a chain of custody issue with having evidence in there. I only want one person accessing that uh, for evidence purposes. So I'm looking into evaluation whether to Obtain a little metal building that same color kind of fits in better with it that's a little bigger that I can separate with a chain link inside that building and only want one person be able to access the evidence where we keep bigger evidence items or take the living room really close to the building and park it out in the side away from the main building there. That's maybe a year down the road. We're looking at that. Other than that, prosecution will be some things to focus on looking at for future. Thanks, Chief. Uh, vehicles, we're going to fly through these next couple things. Um, we have multiple ones that we're looking to swap out. We're evaluating mileage and the, the recent maintenance problems or issues we've had with them um, between public works and parks. Um, I, think, and I think those are the two areas where we, we've got about six vehicles that were, five, sorry, that we're evaluating and we'll, we'll tighten that up. We're, we're still getting some preliminary numbers. Things are, are so expensive, it's maybe postponed, but do we lose on that? That's the question, so. Um, library card reimbursement, just an FYI, we'll talk about this in a future budget meeting. The mayor asked me to look into um, those reimbursements. We're currently at $50 per year per household on a library card reimbursement. Uh, we're spending, last year we had about 274 households take advantage of that um, out of 3,000, 26 to 3,000, 100 to 3,000 or so uh, residential units. Does that sound right? Is that too high? 2,800 maybe. Um, I think it's time to revisit it. Okay, so we'll, we'll evaluate that and see if we need to go up a little bit more. I was planning on bringing this to the city council with the fee schedule amendment in, in March. 
just to catch up with the Orem's, you know, to the 50% is now $60. So. It used to be 50%. Now it's just like $50, isn't it? Well, it's 50% up, to, up 50. to 50. And so I found out that they just remember the 50% part. And so the front desk lady would give me the $60. And so I'm like, oh, I wasn't going to be so good. Okay. okay. It's not advertised. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not advertised much. Yeah. And so well, I yeah. went to the library with my colleague. Yeah. It's interesting. There's quite a few folks that this is a big deal, and a lot of the other question is, do we want to support you know educational services for their kids or their family that are digital platforms, not just the physical? Some people say I really love, you know, there's a diff couple media ways to come into a library offering, so. I like to see some things where they lean into a bike shop and it's like, um, it's okay, there's so much on the content that it's funny. Then to be in one of the libraries, I mean, are we ever gonna build a library? And in my opinion, no, there's, there's no <laughs> chance we're ever building a library. And because of that, I'd like to say, but we do have this, especially with the small amount of budget that is there. One of the things too, I, I mean, looking into this, I'll be quick. We can talk about this another night more at length, but you know, Salt Lake County has a, a, a shared program. You can go into any of the libraries there. And one of the things that's been interesting is here in Utah Valley, we're more siloed, right? You know, so Orem and Provo kind of have a sharing agreement. And then some of the North Utah County cities share, and then, you know, others are individual. And so I talked with one of our planning commissioners, you know, what could be the process to maybe get a countywide um, sharing thing, but it's, I don't know when or if that's gonna get any legs, but um, so right now people feel like, well, I really wanna have what Salt Lake has, and some are willing to go up to that system with our offering, and others say, well, I wish I could, you know, have more variety, so we can, uh, we could, we could hold a community, we could hold a, you know, <laughs> survey monkey survey with out in the community or we could look at or just decide we're going to fund a certain amount or what how we want to go about it so okay we'll bring that up that's one of our issues in future meetings so uh facilities maintenance just an fyi this looks like a big dollar item it is a big dollar item approximately four hundred seventy five thousand. alex is looking at various projects across the city we have a growing city and an aging city and so um, a lot of just maintenance issues that he's staying on top of and maybe you've seen some of those upgrades or things in um, just Don't maintenance issues I didn't say that this next one last page there um, the metal roof I do need some direction from you on this we last fall so we bid this out as just a refresher and we had some numbers that were in that 130-ish range for keeping the metal roof on this building and repla replacing it with a metal roof um, we've got the paint is all fading and coming off one end and we had some leaks which we fixed in the back um, but then we've got issues with the gutters that are leaking all over the place and the gutter system needs to be redone so Alex rebid this again. That was the direction from last fall was to rebid it in the, in the spring. He had three bids. The low was very similar. I think we were 132 in the fall. Uh, the low bid at this time around is 134 for a metal seam roof, brown, similar to what we have on now. And that includes replacing the gutter system. Um, with with two of those bidders, they said, we were only holding this for 30 days and metal prices are going nuts. And so this is more of something that I wanna see if you're comfortable with us saying, yes, go ahead and we'll bring this item forward in a budget amendment in March. Okay. See what the numbers are. Okay. There are cheaper options. I, I'm throwing that out there. And asphalt roof or we add another client we looked at where it's a rubber type of membrane that you spray on and we showed you some of those samples i'm seeing some head, head shaking 20 or 21 years 
the company is out of business, and so their warranty is defunct. Oh my God, it did should have lasted much, yeah. much longer. Just no question. Does that sound right? Was it yeah. 1997? Is that yeah. when it was built? Yeah. Anyway. 25. 25, okay. We did have <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. It turned out being what they said you could do a facility with it and then you said they must have built it. You came up with this. You think? Yeah. Would you like it? Well, they asked. Which is well, yeah, they did. It's a big up. public yeah. visual thing. So, a um, couple other things not on here. How are we doing? We doing all right? You guys feel like the city's going in a good direction? Okay. I think we're doing great. Yeah. I don't know how I'm so pleased with how flexible, how nimble uh, our department heads are with the directions on the bus and the stuff that we get now. I mean, that's just a phenomenal uh, step for us. So I think things are going pretty good. And a, a question, when we talk to people, it's like, when you've heard me talk about this, that how far we know this. Project or something, residents feel left out. They want to be able to provide input. They want to know about things happening. I don't know how we do that. I mean, I know what we have on our yeah. newsletter and website, but I think that'd be just kind of an overall question: is how do we engage people sooner so that they know it's happening, that it's a potential before it happens? They, they're, they're just part of the process. Sort of aware more so that it's. Too many of them would say, yeah, the city just came and did this. And that, that doesn't cause too much alarm, but. Yeah. And that's just too late. Yeah, that's well, we all know that. I mean, it's they, the joint they, they, they wait until yeah. it, it inconvenienced them instead of being active in, in the process. But again, our neighbors need to be deeper than to be active in the process. Yeah, that's it, just it, my it, question. There's a couple okay. things that yeah. we can. So right now, it's still mailed. Notices are required on most site plan and conditional uses and subdivisions. Um, it's really that, that buffer and distance on how far we mail those. That's that's totally up to you guys. And so I always want that increase. Yeah. But, but like uh, we're doing, looking at a master plan. This tells you how often I go to our website. Are we posting it there that we're looking at this, that people want input or? So for that, we'll have a, definitely a social media presence So anyway, it would be just, hey, this is what we're doing. We're sending it out to bid. We're trying to, maybe you'll have an opportunity to weigh in. Anyway, just as much as we can to okay. educate, inform. And I think at that point, you bring up that's on social media. And I've got every social media platform. And I never look at them. <laughs> I'm like, and it's my fault. But just, I'll go to our website. And so maybe you could say, just yeah. tag to say, um, I don't know, just a, a, one little yeah, sentence. Yeah. You know, see yeah. this. Or you guys, we are doing this. For those who just want to use one thing, one one platform, and that would be our city website, and that would be the default instead of on our Facebook or Instagram or something like that. Okay, we'll yeah, we'll great. bring that up. So with our joint meetings, that would be a good topic. So great topic, and I, we did Mike, did we not to Van's point increase the the footage? We have not. We discussed doing it, so maybe we look at that again with council opening. I have people would, say they want to. I know we can feel what yeah. state requirements are and that we feel it's a good distance. Many residents that get missed out do not feel that it's a good distance. I think that it's, I think that it's better than maybe not every good thing is still required. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most of those. Yeah, most of those are subsidized. Yeah, and I realize I'm not suggesting that people are going to devour those and do all their due diligence. Yeah. But when we, if we have a good plan, it's nice to well, we did all of this, and it was just kind of them choosing not to engage, not. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't set the time that we just thought that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the website. 
costs nothing really. And so I'd like to see that happen with the water. Okay. Okay. Um, just throwing this out, I know you guys have talked about a youth city council. We're planning to put in 1500 to 2500 somewhere in that range on youth city council. The chief can update us on and the we'll police academy, maybe the next yeah. council meeting, and then our youth city council. We're going to be so meeting to get that. And we, we're only going to need very, very tiny budget. Um, PG, Linden Chamber, Gala, we were able to fundraise, and um, so we'll have a nice little bucket to start with on both those groups so um, one thing that I also just needed to bring up I spoke with Kelly Hughes Johnson our emergency coordinator um, she mentioned and, and Mike I don't know if you guys circled back today since I talked with her but um, so our CERT community emergency response team um, this is where you have volunteers in the community who have pretty high level disaster response training and kind of like a go kit um, we used to have a really active CERT, but maybe in the past 10 years it's just kind of dwindled and we haven't had as many people certified or refreshed or active teams. And so one of the things that Kelly would really like to get going, we've talked about, is right now the city of Orem has an instructor and we can kind of tag in, but we haven't, she'd like to maybe see if she could have some funding potentially to get our own, you know, robust CERT activities going and have maybe an instruction right here within Linden. Um, typically they need kind of like a kit of materials and supplies and I'm sure Chief is really familiar with this and I'm not sure it falls under your budget. She was saying maybe 1500 to 2000. Um, I don't know if that's something that would fall under you or we would need to maybe allocate something separate yeah, for that. That's, that's, that's an easy lift. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, throw it in with your, okay, so I didn't get a chance yeah. to circle back with you on that, so so really appreciate that. Most people that. would be willing to pay that mm -hmm. fee, at least a portion. Yes. Maybe a matching thing. I mean, I have been organizing all, all of this. Um, I haven't opened up yeah. <laughs> She's getting us registered. Kind of She's getting us registered again and looking to get that rolling and get some more programs. We would certainly want to reach out to the three distinct ecclesiastical bodies. Yes. <laughs> All right. Catholic too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Issues, big issues? Okay. Thank you. A lot of cities do this in like a big retreat and we fire hose, drinking from a fire hose with you and uh, I'll just say one thing because I hope it's okay. Very much bait and switch when I first came on council ten years ago. It's like, oh, should we do this? <laughs> so I, not, I like how we've changed it to a we, budget. You just kick shove off. it down your throat. <laughs> yeah. Drinks in the firehouse. Uh, more drinks. Maybe a couple years we went to the van hall. Uh, yes, I remember <laughs> doing that. Back. All right. Thank you, everyone. Before we get up, we need a council member to motion to motion adjourn. There we go. Thanks again. Okay, motion. All in favor. Aye. So that was unanimous, Kathy. So she'll be taking minutes from our recording. Motion by Van, seconded by Randy. Everybody else. Daryl. By Daryl. <laughs> She's going to need to know that for the minute. It was me. Uh oh, we're going to have to arm wrestle for it. <laughs> So we, there was a, a business chamber gala and they had like a, a auction and so we'll have about 1500 to 2000 to go perhaps be split halfway between the police academy and the youth council. They're going to be giving a check. So they, they just did it, it just happened last week. Oh, okay. So they haven't okay. presented it yet. Okay. So yes, I need to talk to you about it. There was things that would happen like the Sydney's or something where they would collect money and I was like, so it, the city didn't see that. Yeah, it'll come to you. They'll be sending it to us for sure.
in St. George. Oh, yeah, that's Brandon Graham. He said maybe he couldn't speak. <laughs>